Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Peoria Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's meeting. We appreciate you being here. We're going to begin with a roll call tonight, and that uh, will begin with Vice Chairman Jay Outlewski. Present. Secretary Brian Patterson. Present. Commissioner Sean Hutchinson. Present. Commissioner Linda Grace. Present. Commissioner Clay Alsop. Present. Commissioner Tony Fighter. Present. And Chair Jeff Nelson is present. Uh, I want to officially welcome Commissioner Fighter to the commission. He has been an alternate member and was appointed, I believe, was last month to, uh, as a, last week, <laughs> last week, so he is brand new into the role as a full-fledged member of the commission, so welcome. We're glad to have you. And I want to extend my gratitude and appreciation to uh, Commissioner Condi, who, uh, whose term expired, as I understand it, and whose seat uh, Commissioner Fighter replaced. So um, we'll miss having her here, but uh, we welcome you and uh, look forward to your contributions. All right, we're going to begin with an opening statement that we begin all meetings with. This commission is composed of Peoria citizens who have been appointed by the City Council to serve on the commission as a civic responsibility without compensation. Our duty is to study and review planning and zoning issues within the City of Peoria. The Commission hears zoning cases, holds public hearings, or may conduct a study session on a topic. Decisions made by the Commission are forwarded as written recommendations to the City Council who take the final action. All hearings are conducted in accordance with Robert's Sorry, excuse me, rules for procedures and Robert's rules of order. Each case will be called in the order in which it appears in the agenda unless otherwise announced during the meeting. In the interest of maintaining a fair and efficient hearing, the Commission adheres to the following steps. Chair will open the case. City staff will then provide a brief report and recommendation. The applicant is then invited to give a presentation. Then any member of the public may provide a testimony. Public testimony is limited to three minutes. When we call your name, please come up to the podium and provide your name and address. After all the testimony has been taken, we'll invite the applicant back up to provide any rebuttal or final statements. The Commission will then discuss the case and make its decision. Anyone wishing to speak must complete a speaker's request form and hand it to the Commission assistant on my left. Please be as brief as possible and do not repeat statements already made by others. Any member of the public may appeal to the City Council the decision of the Commission regarding a conditional use permit. The appeal must be submitted in writing to the Planning and Community Development Department within 15 calendar days of the date of the Commission's decision. All Commission recommendations on public hearing items, including general plan amendments, rezones, zoning code amendments, and special plans move forward to a regular City Council meeting. The City Council will then act on the recommendation of the Commission. The City Council may concur with the decision, modify it, overturn it, or remand it back to the Commission for further consideration. We welcome citizens' comments, and as fellow citizens of Peoria, we thank you in advance for your participation. And this will be the final call to submit speaker request forms. I have two here. Do I do we have any more? So uh, if you wish to speak, please fill out a speaker request form and provide it to Ms. Ernest seated at the end of the, seated at the end of the dais, and she will get it to me. Our first action item is the consent agenda tonight, and that consent agenda is for items that are routine in nature and consists of two items. Uh, the item 1C is the minutes, discussion and possible action to approve the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting held on December 12, 2019. Item 2C is a conditional use permit, CU19-12. This is for Ponderosa Relief. This is a request for a conditional use permit to allow for the expansion of an existing medical marijuana dispensary at 9240 West Northern Avenue, Suite 103A. Do any commissioners have any questions or comments about any of the consent agenda items before us tonight? All right. May I have a motion then? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda 1C and 2C as presented. Thank you. We have a motion. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, commissioners. We're now going to move on to our regular agenda. We have a busy agenda tonight and all seven items before us for discussion and possible action. We're going to begin with items 3R and 4R, Providence Professional Park, General Plan Amendment GPA19-04, and Associated Rezone Z19-06. This is a request to amend the existing general plan land use designation on approximately five acres from 
public slash quasi public to office slash local commercial. The site is located at 7825 West Deer Valley Road. This request has been proposed in combination with rezone case Z19-06 to rezone the five acres from Suburban Ranch SR35 to Providence Professional Park Planned Area Development Zoning District. Uh, we'll take action on the general plan amendment and the rezoning request separately, but there'll be one staff report. Uh, staff, would you please present your report? Good evening, Chair, Commissioners. Welcome to our first meeting of 2020. Uh, I will be doing the staff presentation, as you said, for items 3R and 4R together, uh, but you will be taking separate actions on each item since they will be voted upon separately by City Council. Uh, for these companion applications, the applicant is Nathan Cottrell on behalf of the Fellowship of Grace Church, uh, and the applicant is here tonight. The subject site, as you said, is located at 7825 uh, West Deer Valley Road and is approximately five acres. Uh, it's located at the southwest corner of Deer Valley in 878. So the Fellowship of Grace Church has submitted both the general plan amendment and the rezone case because the church is proposing to rezone, as you said, to a planned area development that would facilitate infill development of the north portion of the site. And the church would remain with its uh, building on site and any improvements, but continue operation. So the applicant's general plan amendment request entails changing the current land use category from public use, which only accommodates the existing church to office local commercial. Uh, that office local commercial land use category supports a variety of uh, low intensity commercial development, such as professional offices, medical and legal services, and convenient retail uses. This amendment coincides with the pro proposed rezoning from Suburban Ranch, SR35, to the Providence Professional Park, PAD. Uh, the underlying zoning district of the PAD does correlate with the office commercial or O1 zoning district that's within the city's zoning ordinance, uh, which permits land uses that align with that low intensity neighborhood focused services that are mentioned in the office local commercial uh, land use category. So on screen, you can see a conceptual plan for the subject site and how it will develop. Uh, on screen right now is the south portion, so that has the existing church and improvements and the retention that's in the very southern portion of the parcel. Um, and then the proposed 9,500 square foot office building that would be built adjacent to Deer Valley Road. So on-site currently is the Fellowship of Grace Church that was built back in 2004 with associated on-site improvements such as drive aisles and landscaping. Uh, surrounding the church are the subdivisions of Fletcher Heights to the north, um, Fletcher Farms to the west, Riverstone Estates is on the south of the property, and then east of the subject site is the Arrowhead Ranch Office Park, which has several office and medical uses just across 78th Avenue. It's these office and medical uses which the applicant has noted their PAD and the proposed 9,500 square foot office building would naturally extend west along Deer Valley Road. The Providence Professional Park PAD proposes underlying zoning of office commercial 01 uh, in line with the zoning district outlined in the city's zoning ordinance. The zoning district would allow for the establishment of professional offices, medical and legal services, again, as I stated, and then supporting retail uses. The 01 district acts as a transition between more intense commercial and less intense residential uses. Uh, and you might be wondering, why is the applicant proposing a PAD instead of straight zoning? Uh, the first reason is the site improvements that are existing from when the church was built in 2004 are going to remain. And so the PAD has built-in language that allows for that on-site improvement to remain as is. Uh, namely, that's the landscape buffer that's along the western property edge. The second reason for the PAD uh, is in direct response to staff direction during their early talks with the city. Um, so the direction that was given, since this is an infill site, is that uh, some uses that are permitted as principal uses within the 01 zoning district might cause some traffic concerns or intensity of use concerns. 
As such, the PAD requires that banks and financial institutions, as well as labs that are not accessory to medical offices, require a conditional use permit to be approved. And that inclusion in the PAD will allow city staff a greater level of scrutiny uh, to ensure that parking and intensity of use does not conflict with both the church's continued operation and also the surrounding community. So here again is the site as it is today. Uh, with the monies from selling the northern portion of the site, the church will use that to upgrade the facade of the existing building to complement the proposed 9,500 square foot office building. So it becomes a cohesive development. Um, and they've also proposed some additional on-site improvements such as a ramada for outdoor events, which will be handled through the site plan. Um, forgive the size. Uh, the orientation of this doesn't really work if I switch it to not have north up. Um, but I did wanna show you what the site will look like when it is finished as proposed by the site plan that is currently under review by staff. Um, so you can see the office building in the north and the dry valve that takes access from Deer Valley Road, which will lead north to south, and then the existing church and two accesses from 78th Avenue. <coughs> The updated 2040 general plan guides growth in Peoria through a sustainable manner of focused growth. One of the ways sustainable growth is supported is through the encouragement of contextually appropriate infill development. Uh, the proposed amendment to office local commercial would facilitate infill development that is consistent with what is existing in this area. As you can see on screen, the site is currently zoned Suburban Ranch, SR35. Uh, places of worship are permitted principal uses within that zoning district, but the proposed office land uses would require a rezoning. To recap, the proposed changes to 01 development standards include, uh, first, a site-specific landscape buffer that recognizes the existing 15-foot landscape that is along the western property boundary, uh, along the property boundary with Fletcher Farms. And then also it includes language that would then have the southern portion of the property maintain what's the existing requirement in the zoning ordinance, ordinance which is a 20-foot landscape buffer. Uh, that's both to stay in line with what's in the zoning ordinance, but also in the future, should that very southern portion of the site get sold, um, they would need to maintain that if it was developed. Uh, second, the PAD requires a CUP for banks and financial institutions and labs not accessory to medical offices so that city staff would have greater oversight to mitigate any impacts. Um, staff has found that these applications are in conformance with the general plan policies and goals, as well as a natural extension of the existing development pattern in this area of the city. And do not believe that the proposed development would negatively impact the surrounding neighborhoods. So a notice of application and notice of hearing postcard were mailed to property owners within a 600 foot radius and also HOAs within a one mile radius. Um, the city published an ad in the Peoria Times and the site was posted along Deer Valley Road in accordance with city requirements. The applicant hosted a neighborhood meeting back in November of 2019. Um, only two interested parties attended I say interested parties because they were not property owners or residents in the nearby area. Um, it was a real estate agent and an interested developer who wished to approach the church about developing a car wash on the north portion of the site, which staff um, let them know would be an inappropriate use given its adjacency to residential uses. Uh, the key findings concerning the minor general plan amendment are that the proposed amendment is in conformance with the goals and policies of the 2040 general plan and that the proposed infill development acts as an appropriate transition. For the rezone application, the proposed PAD is in conformance with also the general plan policy and goals in addition to the fact that the standards and guidelines report outline standards which ensure any infill development will be compatible with the existing development in the area. Chairman Nelson, commissioners, uh, the commission will need to make two separate action items for the, or make two separate actions for the items, rather, uh, in tonight's staff presentation. For item 3R, the minor general plan amendment, GPA 19-04, the action is recommended, is to recommend for city council approval. 
And for item 4R, the rezone Z19-06, the action is to recommend for approval to city council subject to the conditions of approval in exhibit one. Uh, that concludes my staff presentation. I'm here if you have any questions. Great, thank you very much for that report. Uh, we have a question from Commissioner Hutchinson. Yes, thanks. Uh, Amanda, so the, uh, in the exhibits that were provided, I'm guessing that was by the, um, by the uh, applicant, uh, there was some uh, reports from West USA Realty about trends in the market, uh, vacancy rates and, um, and uh, risk, uh, asking rent per square foot? Commissioner Hutchinson, that is correct. They right, so. decided to include a market study as a part of one of their exhibits. Okay, it was good information to have and um, is the city in agreement with the information that was provided? We are. Yeah. Okay, that was it, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions from any commissioners? A quick question, so with this underlying PAD, if it was approved, would that allow the church to down the road convert to an office complex as well? Uh, Chairman Nelson, potentially yes, uh, that would be if it was an office or commercial use that was in line with the PAD, they could convert that building. Okay, what is the process for that? Would they have to come back before us, or going back to the city, or can they just do it? Um, so if it was a permitted use, they would be able to outright make the change. Um, okay. Depends what sort of applications they might go through with the city. If they were doing site improvements that were necessary, depending on the use, maybe it required more parking, then they would come in for a site plan amendment. Um, but otherwise, if they're not changing anything outside of the building, they might just do a tenant improvement. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fighter, you have a question? Changed. Commissioner Fighter, uh, one of the conditions of approval recommended by staff is that the existing entry on Deer Valley Road um, be an entrance only. So we have requested on their site plan that they angle the parking. That way when people are coming in on site, you um, decrease the vehicular conflicts so people just pull straight into a parking spot um, and then they would continue down the drive aisle at which point, once it's past that existing section, it could be two-way. But so it would allow for right-in or left-in if you're heading west. And then the ingress-egress on 78th is already there, correct? There is uh, one existing ingress-egress on 78th Avenue. It's um, on the southern, well, southern to the north portion, so it's just right where the, the church is right now. So it's south of the church building. And then there's a new one proposed for the new building that will be north of the church building. So there'll be two on 78th? Correct. We have a so the traffic engineering department has evaluated through the site plan review to ensure that there aren't any interlocking turns for those two entrances on 78th Avenue and we are comfortable with the current placement. Any further questions? No, I'm good. All right, any more questions before I open the public hearing? All right, I'm gonna open the public hearing. Is the applicant present tonight? Do you wish to speak? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Nathan Cottrell, CEG Applied Sciences. My office is 12409 West Indian School in Avondale, but I do live right down the road up here in Peoria. Um, as always, Ms. Beck provides an excellent technical presentation. I didn't need to go into that, but I did want to say that the church, uh, Fellowship of Grace Church, approached us to help them with this. Their intent is not to go anywhere. It's just simplifying finances. So obviously they sell off the North piece. It makes sense to match what's to their east as far as office space, and then upgrade their church and continue their mission. So um, in the foreseeable future, they're not gonna go anywhere. They're not gonna sell it later. I, I don't, obviously they would have that opportunity, but um, I just wanted to present that. And um, this is not like a normal developer that's trying to make money and leave. They're, they're here, they're part of the community, they're, they want to stay. So if you have any other specific questions about use or anything else, 
Anybody have any questions of the applicant? And I would assume that you're in agreement with the stipulation and conditions outlined in the staff report? We, we are. We've worked with staff and we're in agreement with all the steps. Okay. I guess we're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ernest, have you received any speaker request forms on this item? Okay. Is there anybody in the audience that wishes to speak on this item? Going once, going twice. All right. I'm going to close the public hearing. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be taking action on the general plan amendment and the rezoning request separately. Uh, any further questions or comments from commissioners on the general plan amendment specifically, GPA 19-04, before I request a motion? All right, may I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I recommend uh, approval of case uh, GPA 19-04 to the City Council. Thank you, Commissioner Hutchinson. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Patterson. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval of case GPA 19-04 to City Council. Commissioners, please cast your vote. <clears throat> and the general plan amendment passes unanimously. Thank you, Commissioners. Next is a rezoning request for this property. Any further questions or comments from Commissioners? on the rezoning case Z19-06 before we take action. All right, seeing none, may I have a motion? So Chairman, I have a motion that we recommend approval of case Z19-06 to City Council subject to conditions of approval. Thank you, Commissioner Alsop. May I say, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Hutchinson. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval of KZ19-06 to City Council. Commissioners, please cast your votes on this item. And that as well passes unanimously. Thanks, everyone. All right. Next, we're going to move on to items 5R and 6R, Cowley Property, General Plan Amendment GPA 19-02. An associated rezone case Z19-02. This is a request to amend the general plan land use designation on approximately, is this right, is it 280 acres? Okay. To decrease the acreage designated as traditional residential, two and a half to five dwelling units per acre, and increase the park open space land use. The site is located west of the alignment of Ridgeline Road and 135th Avenue and southwest of the alignment of Ridgeline Road and Dysart Road. This request has been proposed in combination with rezone case Z19-02 to, to rezone the 280 acres from the existing suburban ranch, SR35, to the Cowley Project Planned Area Development Zoning District. As we did with the last case, commissioners, we're going to take action on the general plan amendment and the zoning request separately, but there'll be one staff report. And staff, would you please present your report? Chairman Nelson, commissioners, uh, I just want to take a moment to thank you in advance for your attention during this presentation. Cali property rezoning is a large and extremely complex case. Uh, while I have tried to cover only the highlights, there is a lot of information, so please bear with me. The applicant for case GPA 19-02 and Z19-02 is Susan Demet on behalf of the developer Mad Me Homes. The subject site is composed of three parcels, uh, which total approximately 280 acres, that are at the edge of the city's current municipal boundary. Um, generally, as you can see on screen, the northernmost portion of the site is located west of the future alignment of Ridgeline Road and 135th Avenue. Uh, the remainder of the site is generally located southwest of Ridgeline Road and Dysart Road. The proposals, as previously highlighted by Chairman Nelson, are to modify the existing general plan land use designations and to rezone the property to planned area development to develop an 838 single family community. And I just wanna stress that that 838 lots is the maximum that the PAD could achieve. That does not necessarily mean that will be the future build out for the community. The applicant's minor general plan amendment request is only a modification of the existing traditional residential and park open space land use categories. Um, you can see the change highlighted on screen. So this is what is existing. 
And this is what the applicant is proposing. That would increase the park open space within that section of the land use map. <clears throat> The rezone request is to change the existing Suburban Ranch SR43 zoning district to the Cali property planned area development. Um, the development standards for this project would yield lots similar to the lot sizes that are within the surrounding developments, so Trilogy, Vestancia, Sonoran Place, and Granite Hills. Uh, I'll also get into their actual development standards a little bit later. So as staff noted last year for the Haciendas at White Peak public hearing, this site is located beyond the existing roadway network. Uh, the subject site is three vacant parcels, so the southernmost which which contains a portion of the Kilauea Crusher's mine that is no longer in operation. The remaining portion of the mine is on state land further west of the property, as you can see on screen. Um, North of the site is the Haciendas at White Peak development, which is currently in pre-plat review with staff. It's not under construction as of yet. West of the site is a 160-acre private property parcel, the Exodyne property, as you see on screen. Uh, and then west and south of the site is unincorporated Maricopa County, that is state land. East of the site are several subdivisions. We have Trilogy West, uh, Trilogy of Estancia, and the two new subdivisions of Sonoran Place and Granite Hills that are currently under construction. Ah, now on to the details of the PAD. To the right of the screen, you can see the conceptual development plan that roughly lays out what land would be developed and what land would be open space or remain as preserved natural open space. The large site is proposed to be developed in two development areas. So you have the north parcel, which is the two northernmost parcels. It's about 100, uh, 120 acres. And then you have the south parcel, which you can see on screen, Dynamite Road acts as the dividing line, so to speak, between north and south development areas. The PAD proposes the three lot sizes you see on screen. Um, these lot sizes are similar to the various lot sizes in surrounding developments, which range in size as small as 5,520 square feet, upwards of 12,000 square feet. So those three definitely fit within the existing range that we've seen in the surrounding development. The open space for the PAD is approximately 30% of the net site area, uh, which meets the city's minimum standards for open space requirements. Amenities, which I'll touch upon in more detail in the next slide, uh, include pocket parks, so six total, that's three in the northern parcel and three in the southern parcel, uh, wash trail system, and then also creating a 75 foot landscape buffer that's adjacent to Trilogy of Estancia. <coughs> um, so the programming for the amenities are going to be addressed through a recreation and amenities master plan. Um, we've done this once before with the Mystic ramp, uh, but basically what we will do, um, we've included language in the PAD and the conditions of approval that allow them to do a ramp, and that ramp will then, um, by development area, detail the different prog programmatic amenities for each, the pocket parks, the trail system, what the general theming and character is, so it's cohesive across the community. <clears throat> um, so now onto the details of the natural open space, or the areas that will contain the naturally occurring Sonoran Desert uh, landforms and flora that are going to be conserved. Um, you have a trail system that will run throughout, so it'll kind of follow the existing wash system that runs north to south on site. Uh, and the natural open space also helps to conserve significant hillside areas on site. Um, the usable open space will feature distinctive pocket parks, which the PAD requires that each pocket park feature a minimum of three design elements. Um, some of those examples might include uh, themed pocket parks, so what they've included in their PAD for example, a butterfly garden, a sensory garden, or a meditation garden. Um, other features would be exercise and balance stations, shade structures, lawn games, in combination, as long as they're meeting those three minimum design elements. As for the lot standards themselves, you can see the minimum lot sizes and widths on screen. 
Lot coverage and setbacks are standard to what we have seen with other PADs in the city. Um, I do want to highlight, following the neighborhood meeting, staff worked with the applicant to modify the property development standards to reflect a request by several Trilogy at Vestancia residents. Um, because of the feedback, the lots within the south parcel have uh, an additional restriction. So lots that are within 100 feet of that boundary will be required to be single story only. And that will be on both the pre-plats and the final plats for those subdivisions. The Cali property PAD also requires a mix of lots to ensure variation throughout the community. So a minimum of the lots cumulative to both north and south parcel will be required to be over 7,000 square feet. And then also 25% of the total lots will be required to be over 8,000 square feet. A series of pre-plats for the north parcel have been submitted for staff review. Um, they aren't currently approved. We're still working through revisions, uh, but while staff will look to ensure these requirements are being met by both the north and south parcel, the burden of meeting that requirement will likely fall to the south parcel given the proposed layout that staff has seen for the north parcel. Um, now something more unique to the Cali property. Due to its proximity to the foothills that are west of the site, uh, there is some significant hillside area. And development in hillside is always more complex than just good old fashioned flat land. Staff has worked very closely with the applicant to work through impacts to these hillside areas. Ultimately, the Cali property PAD balances preserving hillside by restricting the disturbance area in the development. And this in turn creates a need for retaining walls. We consider a retaining wall, any wall that holds back 12 or more inches of dirt. So I have on screen a comparison of what wall heights are permitted by the zoning ordinance and those proposed by the PAD. To mitigate visual impact, the PAD is proposing that retaining walls over nine feet shall be terraced. Um, so they'll be landscaping within those terraces and they'll break up the height of the wall. Uh, these walls might occur when two lots abut each other, say rear to rear yard, uh, where the two pads differ in elevation enough that a retaining wall is required. This would mean backyards would contain terraced walls which would have an HOA easement over them for future maintenance purposes. But as I said, the Cali PAD outlines limiting disturbance in hillside areas. Any land over 10% is defined as hillside within the city's zoning ordinance. The PAD outlines standards when platting lots in such areas. First, there's a minimum lot size that would need to be met if you are developing or you're platting a lot within those hillside areas. Next, the PAD specifically prohibits platting lots in slope categories over 20%. Um, under the regulations of the Hillside Development Overlay District in the Zoning Ordinance, specifically Section 21-713, uh, development in slope categories is allowed in slope categories as high as 40% under our current zoning ordinance. Uh, so the applicant has chosen to restrict their development further. Uh, there is a slope analysis for the site included in the PAD is one of the exhibits, which you can see on screen here. This is the uh, middle parcel, if you will, of the north parcel. And this is the south parcel. <coughs> As you can see with the chart from the PAD, the applicant has estimated how many lots would be in each slope category. And they have limited as much as possible the number that goes in either the 10 to 15 or the 15 to 20% slope category. And then are proposed over that 20% 20, 20 slope category. Uh, now I want to address circulation because that has come up um, in discussions with residents in the area. Uh, first, I want to talk about access more than the actual circulation itself. Um, I promise this is the last big chunk of information <laughs> before we get to the staff analysis. So major access points for the various phases of development will take access from Dysart Road for phase one in the north parcel. Off of the roundabout, at Ridgeline Road and 135th Avenue for phase two in the north parcel, and off of Dysart Road in the south parcel. <clears throat> the city's requirement that subdivisions have secondary access 
will be addressed by future right away, including Morning Vista Lane, which is at the very northern portion. That's for phase two in the north parcel. Uh, interim improvements for Dynamite Road that divides the north parcel from the south parcel. And then for phase, for the southern parcel, uh, you'll see several future collector roads that are proposed to do an internal spine road for circulation within the south parcel. <clears throat> Because of the importance of ensuring secondary access for the various phases of the development areas, staff has proposed several conditions of approval uh, that would address timing and disposi disposition of right-of-ways, excuse me. Um, for example, should the haciendas at White Peak Development that is north of this proposed development never come to fruition, the developer for Cali would be required to complete interim improvements, basically their um, right away half street improvements that we generally require for developers. So the Cali developer would be required to do the Morning Vista Lane half street improvements to ensure secondary access for their subdivisions in the phase two of the north parcel. In regard to when right away improvements will occur, um, please watch the screen. I've tried to do an animated, animated uh, time frame for you guys. So phase one of the North Parcel will complete their half street improvements of Dysart Road up to the sub subdivision entrance that's proposed. Phase two of the North Parcel will be required to complete a roundabout which joins Ridgeline Road with 135th Avenue and half street improvements for Morning Vista Lane if Haciendas at White Peak does not develop. Phase three of the North Parcel will complete the half street for, Di for Dynamite Road, or excuse me, they will complete the rest of the half street improvements for Dysart Road, as well as provide the interim condition for Dynamite Road. That will provide the secondary access for one of the subdivisions proposed within phase three. Once the South Parcel develops, the Dynamite Road right away will be completed and the developer will complete full street improvements as each phase of development comes in. Um, and that's within their site boundaries. Because south of the parcel boundary is state land, the developer will construct Dysart Road as interim conditions within an existing easement uh, that would basically have the right of way as an interim condition rather than as a full arterial. Staff has included timing mechanisms to address if the south parcel should not develop to ensure that Dysart Road is connected with Joe Max Road depending on the timing of development within the overall community. You can read those in exhibit one, conditions of approval. So let me summarize the staff analysis concerning these two cases. The general plan amendment is a modification of the existing land use categories of traditional residential and park open space. Um, staff is in support of the proposed change, which does increase the amount of park open space on the land use map. As for the rezoning, staff has worked very closely for over a year with the applicant to work through various impacts that might develop because of the proposal. Um, in addition, staff believes that the applicant's property development standards, their amenities, and the improvement timing that is proposed with this align with the goals and policies of the general plan. Additionally, the development standards would continue an existing character and development pattern we see in this area of the city. Staff believes that the proposals meet or exceed several goals and policies within the 2040 Peoria General Plan and are therefore in line with the city's future vision of development for this area. As part of the public, public participation process required by state statute and city ordinances, a notice of application and hearing postcards were mailed to property owners and HOAs. Additionally, the city did also publish an ad in the paper, and the applicant posted the site in two locations given the size of the subject site. The applicant did hold a neighborhood meeting back in August of 2019, 31 residents attended, and an overview of the concerns raised at the meeting are shown on the slide. At the time of tonight's presentation, staff did receive written opposition to both the general plan amendment and rezone cases. Many of the residents' concerns and reasons for opposition were similar to those that have been brought up during the neighborhood meeting and subsequent conversations staff has had with residents. Um, traffic congestion and needing additional roadways, 
disagreement with the proposed Cali density, concerns about school capacity, and a belief that this area of the city is lacking in public safety services. That opposition was passed out to you tonight as an addendum to the staff report. Also included in that addendum is the letter from the Peoria Unified School District, uh, which notes that PUSD and the applicant are in discussions for a developer assistance agreement, but currently no terms have been agreed to at this time. To summarize, staff's key findings for the Minor General Plan Amendment, GPA 19-02, are that the proposal is in conformance with the 2040 General Plan, and the proposed density is within the traditional residential range. The rezone request, D19-02, is also in conformance with the General Plan. The development standards continue the existing development pattern and character, and the proposal meets the city's minimum open space requirements. In addition, staff have proposed several conditions of approval which ensure important right-of-way improvements are completed at necessary times. For item 5R, staff recommends approval to City Council, and for item 6R, staff recommends approval to City Council subject to the conditions of approval. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we've made it to the end of the staff presentation. Um, staff is available to answer any questions, and the applicant is also present tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Uh, it's an important project. It, it required more time, and I appreciate you giving that detailed information. Um, do any commissioners uh, have any questions of Ms. Becker or any of city staff? Oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Lewski. No worries. I, um, a clarification on the Joe Max extension timing, because um, I do see traffic continuing to build in that area as we continue to develop it, which is naturally going to occur. Um, timing of getting Joe Max to the 303, I, could you remind me of that? Chairman Nelson and commissioners, it's in our capital improvement pro program to construct, well, ADOS is going to construct the interchange at Joe Max and 303 next fiscal year. We're going to build a road that connects 303 uh, along the uh, Joe Max alignment to Vistancia and put a traffic signal at Vistancia on Joe Max. The plan is next fiscal year also. So okay. at that time, in a year from now, maybe a year and a half from now, you'll start seeing the construction of the road and a, a new traffic signal at Joe Max of Vistancia that will eventually take you to Loop 303. Okay, any plans to go from Vistancia to Dysart? A good question. And um, can you, uh, Mr. Gleason, can you go to the circulation map? Uh, and so, Okay, that, that, that's uh, the last map. Sorry, I, it, it's easier with an, an exhibit. That one's good. All right, uh, uh, Chair Nelson and commissioners, <clears throat> at this time, we've identified that there will be a future need of Joe Max connecting over from Dysart to Vistancia. Uh, we've actually done a design concept report, engineering, city of Peoria, to kind of identify what that alignment could be, would be in the future. Uh, some of it will be development driven. However, if this project goes through and builds the Dysar alignment to Joe Max, that'll put the burden, if there's no development back on the city to make that connection, to get uh, these residents a second way in and out of this development. And not just, it's not just the Cali development, there's other developments in this area that will benefit from that Dysar alignment going down to Joe Max. Uh, right now, the time is not known. It'll be, it'll be dependent on development, but it, we have identified a need. It, we have a design concert report that identifies the alignment, and we will program it when development suggests that we should move forward and, and build that road. Um, one thing I want to point out is um, we worked really hard with the applicant to try to figure out the traffic in this area. Uh, for the, what we call the north parcel and south parcel. The north parcel is going to be served basically at the intersection on Ridgeline and Vistancia. Right now, the city of Peoria has identified that uh, it meets warrants today, so the city's going to be installing a traffic signal at that intersection. It's under design right now, and our goal is to build it next fiscal year. And so that's something that will probably be in place before Cali starts constructing anything as far as actually bring in new homeowners. They'll, they'll be under construction for infrastructure and that, but actual new homeowners will probably have the benefit of a new traffic signal at Ridgeline of Estancia. And then working hard with their traffic engineer, we identified that the good trigger, trigger to extend Dysart all the way down to Joe Max was when they reached that dynamite alignment. Uh, 
They identified a, a number of lots under 300 for the north, and 300 is a good number. It works for the intersection on Ridgeline of Estancia as far as level of service. We can make that work with the traffic signal. We also can make it work when they extend south of Dynamite without Dysart, but that was a good logical stopping point. Say, so, you know what? This is the time to start thinking about making that connection to the south and provide a second option for this area to get in and out of the community. Okay, and if I'm correct, the south end coming out Dynamite or Dysart could then go down to Happy Valley and proceed over to the um, connector to Vistancia near the 303? That's their south exit is Dysart down to Happy Valley? Uh, I can't talk about Dysart going to Happy Valley. What, what we're focused on is Dysart to Joe Max, Joe Max over to Vistancia and the new traffic interchange at 303. Okay. Uh, that, that will soon be constructed. Okay, thank you. Uh, eventually, Dysart will go to Happy Valley and, and all that connection will be made. But our focus has always been, let's get folks to the 303 and get them off Happy Valley, which right now we're under construction of a pretty significant project. But we're, the intent was to try to get some traffic off Happy Valley, put them at Joe Max to get them on 303. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Alsop, you have a question? Yeah, I know um, Amanda had talked a little bit about state land. Was any of this PD, PAD currently state land, or that's just adjacent to the property? Commissioner Alsop, that is only land that's adjacent to the property, and that's beyond the 160-acre um, Exodyne property. Um, this project and several other pieces of land in this area of the city were actually annexed into the city um, several years ago, which is why the municipal boundary expanded westward. Um, but the particulars, the particular parcels for this project are not on state land. And on a, another note, do the um, impact fees that the builders pay include payments to the school districts? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Alsop, there are no um, impact fees for schools. It's not, it's not a service that the city provides. It, the impact fees are, are identified on the, in the categories that we can uh, charge under state statute, and they include things like um, limited parks, uh, road, regional roadways, and things like that, things, services that the city provides. A, the school district is a separate and distinct entity. So the school funding comes solely from the taxes of the properties? The school funding comes from the sales of state land. It also comes from property tax. It also comes from the state. The state is the, uh, uh, provides the uh, revenue source for the, for the schools. Okay. Thank you. I'll stop. Just to add to that, um, the applicant has been in discussion with PUSD. They just haven't reached the final terms of their agreement. Um, I will rely on them to maybe provide some additional details since they are the ones who are actually in discussion with PUSD, but I know that they have already started those discussions and are trying to work through the terms for a developer assistant, assistance agreement. Great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Ms. Beck, a question on the trail system that you mentioned goes through the property. Is that open to the public? I mean, surrounding residents who would not live in this development, or is that just for use of those who, folks who live in the development? If it Chairman Nelson, that's a good question. Uh, the applicant has proposed that this is not going to be a gated community, at least in the north parcel, so those would be trail systems that the public could access. And the Parks and Recreation and Community Facil Parks Recreation and Community Facilities Department has requested that they do an access easement over those trails. Great, thank you very much. Um, question for our attorney regarding the lack of a development agreement with the school district. That's particularly troubling to me. Uh, I understand we're they're in active conversation, and maybe we'll hear some more about that. But um, assuming that that uh, could we predicate a condition of approval or recommendation of approval? on the completion of a partnership agreement with the school district, would that be something we legally could do or uh, not? Mr. Chair, uh, members, um, I'd say no. Uh, I don't think that this commission has the authority to predicate your decision upon what a different government entity is or isn't going to be doing with the applicant. Okay. All right, thank you. See no further question. Um, oh, Commissioner Alsop, you have another question. Sorry. 
Yeah, more of a follow-up comment. I, I appreciate the question to our attorney. Um, on, on in regards to the developer assistance agreements, you know, I think it's great that developers are working with the school district. I was going to make my position clear that um, if the developers wish to assist the school districts, that's great, uh, but I would be uncomfortable with holding our approval on condition of that voluntary contribution. Otherwise, it doesn't seem very voluntary to me. Um, so I'm suspecting there's going to be some comments on that, but uh, my position is that uh, those voluntary contributions should remain voluntary. Great. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other questions or comments before we move to the public hearing? All right. I'm going to open the public hearing. Is the applicant present tonight? I assume you wish to speak. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening. I'm Susan Demet with Gamage and Burnham. I am just here to tell you that I am the applicant and I am not going to speak tonight for reasons that are probably obvious. Um, I am going to turn this over to uh, Hillary Turby with um, ABLA, now formerly Anderson Barron, to give the presentation. I will help assist her in answering any questions um, after the fact as needed. So thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Hillary Turby. I'm with ABLA. Um, our office address is 50 North McClintock Boulevard in Chandler, Arizona. Um, I am here tonight uh, with Madame e. Holmes, and we're pleased to present this PAD for the Kelly property to facilitate a development um, of a cohesively designed single family residential community characterized by a diverse um, product types and home sizes in a setting that's responsive to the natural environment. Um, the Kelly property is currently vacant and approximately 280 acres in size. Adjacent is are the recently approved Sonoran Place and Granite Hill subdivisions, as well as uh, Trilogy at Vistancia. Um, the change, the request uh, for the change in the general plan um, goes from traditional residential uh, with parks and recreation um, to now a more restrictive traditional residential with more parks and recreation set aside. The uh, traditional residential land use allows for between 2.5 and 5 dwelling units per acre. And as staff pointed out, we're coming in at the very, very low end with a maximum density of 3.0 um, dwelling units per acre. Um, our zoning request is from SR43 to PAD, um, which matches the general plan designation for the area. Uh, the property is divided into two areas to allow development uh, to move forward in response to market demands. Um, in total, 838 maximum units are requested with a maximum density of 2.99 dwelling units per acre. Um, there are three requested lot sizes on the property. Um, each of those lot sizes can be found in the surrounding communities within this area of Peoria and within Vistancia. Um, we have dedicated at least 50% of those lots uh, to be greater than 7,000 square feet as well as 25% over 8,000 square feet. Um, in addition, this plan solves a regional transportation issue that has been ignored by past uh, projects in the area. Um, the extension of Dynamite to Joe Max will now connect Vistancia, um, the surrounding projects, including Sonoran Place and um, Granite Hills, um, down to Joe Max, providing that second necessary second point of access, um, solving that regional transportation issue. The north parcel contains three phases of development and has been conceptually designed to accommodate 297 dwelling units. Again, that's a maximum, and within the north, the maximum uh, density is 2.48, so even lower than um, uh, what was proposed overall for the development. 
In the south, it's conceptually been designed um, to accommodate 541 dwelling units um, at a density of 3.33 dwelling units per acre. I'd say most importantly, um, the project has planned with um, an excess of open space. Um, the project has been des designed as a conservation subdivision, uh, which means that it's placed the lots in the most developable portions of the project area while preserving um, those important parts uh, of the natural environment, including the major wash that runs north-south across the property and in the major hillside areas to the west of the property and at the southwest corner of the property. Um, overall, 81 acres or 29% of the project will, will be um, preserved as natural open space. Um, within those areas, we also have planned at least three pocket parks in the north parcel, at least three in the south parcel, as well as um, one of those parks um, having at least one acre um, with um, turf play area for the residents. Um, Again, this is an ungated community, so these resources um, will be accessible by anyone in the, the region. Um, these are conceptual drawings for the amenity areas in the north. These were included in our initial um, uh, proposal with our ramp for the north area. Uh, we have um, phase one park, which is the uh, lower left-hand corner. Phase two is the upper um, graphic. And then phase three is that lower um, right-hand graphic. Um, the wash corridors are an important part of our project. Not only do they um, create a natural um, relief within the area uh, between development areas, but they, it also provides um, an opportunity for residents to traverse the site um, in a natural setting, opposed to on a sidewalk or um, on a major road. Um, so conceptually, residents would be able to um, traverse through a trail, um, hop onto a sidewalk, um, cross, um, dynamite, get onto the trails on the eastern side of the project, um, you know, walk up that 75-foot corridor, which will also have a trail, um, and then actually onto the Granite Hills 75-foot um, trail, onto the Sonoran Place 75-foot trail, loop back around onto Ridgeline um, and up. Um, the options are pretty endless. It's pretty cool. Um, and in terms of key points, just to wrap up, um, this project, again, solves a major transportation um, issue that's been um, present within the area for the last few years. It's made worse by some of the more recent developments. This project solves that issue. Uh, we have an excess amount of open space. Um, Mattamy does something special with their lots um, in terms of how they place them on a streetscape. You're not going to see the same product all in one clump. You're going to see a 45 foot next to a 55 foot next to 365 foot. Um, they like to mix and match, match their products so you don't have this cookie cutter look throughout their project. Um, Again, there's meaningful natural community open space. Like I said, you can jump from a trail to hiking in the, the foothills um, down to you know sidewalks down Dysart. Um, we've tried really hard to um, sensitively plan the development um, to create developable, developable areas um, that preserve as much natural open space as possible. That's a, a key feature of the site. We have no plans to you know, wreck that feature, that only helps us. Um, we have continued that 75 foot buffer along um, the trilogy of Estancia. Um, that buffer area um, will have one story homes uh, within 100 feet of the development. And um, the applicant is diligently working on agreements um, with other development 
developments in the area in terms of transportation as well as parks and recreation and uh, the school districts. And with that, I'd ask, I'd answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you for that. Uh, commissioners, any questions of the applicant? Commissioner Hutchinson. Uh, yes, uh, did, did you want to speak to um, anything about the uh, agreement with the school district? Hold on. <clears throat> My apologies. Um, we have been in discussions with the school district regarding a voluntary um, assistance agreement. We are committed to enter into an agreement with the school district. We are working through with them the amount of that um, donation at this time. Um, there was, a, there was a, uh, agreements that were reached for both the recent Taylor Morrison project, which is um, to just kind of to the east of us on the other side of Dysart Road, as well as the Ashton Woods project that is under construction. Um, we were committed to provide a, an assistance agreement that was equal in amount and terms um, as to what those developers were asked to do. Uh, the school district has asked us to do something a little bit different, so we're working through that with them right now. We hope to have that finalized before this goes to council, if that helps. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from commissioners? Nope. Uh, I would assume the applicant, you're in agreement with the stipulations and conditions outlined in the staff report. We are, and we'd like to thank staff for working diligently with us through this process. Um, we're in agreement with all of the stipulations. Okay. I don't think we have any further questions. We'll call you back up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a, a couple of folks who want to speak on this uh, from the audience. And we're going to begin with, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name, I probably will, Gregory Steinbiss. Very good. Did I do all right? You did great. Right. You can state your uh, name and address for the record, please. My name is Gregory Steinbiss. I live at 13401 West Hummingbird Terrace. That's in Vista uh, Trilogy. My property actually overlooks and sees this property. Uh, I've lived there since December of last year, uh, December 18, so I'm a newbie here. Uh, came from California. I apologize for that. But um, I think you guys are at a juncture here today, tonight. And, it, and we shouldn't just look at this project by itself, because right now you've got a big project being built at the corner of Deer Valley and North uh, Lake Pleasant Parkway, you've got the 80 homes at Sonoran Place, you've got 80 homes at Granite Hills, 300 homes if they're approved at Hacienda, and this 800. Uh, that's, you know, 1,300 plus whatever that big project's going to be. Where's that water going to come from? The state just recently, or the, all the agreements have stated they're going to cut back on their allotment to the state. And even though the city has been granted rights, and uh, this last summer, one of the city people told me that we are going to use 10% of our allotment. Well, that's great. You know, we got 90% more to go, but w if there's nothing out there, 90% of nothing is still nothing. That 90% 90, 90 is going to mean nothing in the future. So where is the future water going to come from? So we got to think about our development in, a, in the broader sense, with all the new homes going up in... Upper Fastancia, as well as these other projects. Have we thought about maybe using recycling water for all landscape, not just for the common areas like golf courses and public parks, but maybe we should be looking at changing the building codes to allow water, recycled water for residential landscaping? Well, that means infrastructure has to change, more meters, that type of a thing, but also for fire suppression. Maybe instead of using clean water, what, fire suppression into our homes, we should use right recycle water. So that's one of the things that we need to talk about. Roads, let's talk about traffic. You've brought it up earlier, and I hate to disagree with staff over there, but the uh, presentation was just recently made at, up at Trilogy, saying that uh, Vistancia, the Joe Max to Vistancia is scheduled for 2030. That's when it's in the capital improvement budget. And some other roads, uh, for example, Lone Mountain going across to over to the other side of the river would be 2040, that type of a thing. And we shouldn't wait for development to help us decide where we're going to put things. So one of the things I would suggest maybe as part of this development, if it's going to go forward, is that 
Jomax be completed from, Dixolet, uh, from Dysart over to at least the water treatment plant. The road is already there halfway from the water treatment plant to El Mirage. So at least that would give the fire department, the police department, and other first responders a quick access to this building area. The problem with more development out as we're going out is it stretches resources. Roads have to be paved further out. Water pipes are further out. You may need new lift stations to pump water and or sewer backwards. Uh, we would need additional dedicated police out there. Right now, the police have told us we have one dedicated person for all of Estancia. You add another 1,300 homes, and plus whatever else is going in Estancia, you're going to need another policeman, and where's that resource going to come from? So, you know, so I want you, I think we're at a crossroads, and we need to think about the broader, what we're doing here in Peoria as a whole. Now, I came from a community back in 1976 that schools were in double session. We had a water problem. Of course, in California, we always had a water problem. We had traffic problems. And so bodies like you were pro still proving development. And the citizens said that was enough. And so the citizens passed a growth control initiative based on population. So population can only grow so much, that created so many housing units per year. And that ordinance has been renewed for the last 40 years. Every 10 years it comes up, it was renewed. And I would hate to see this community, this city, get to that point where the citizens might have to come up and pass its own growth control initiative because you haven't thought about the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate you being here. I'm going to move to our next speaker, uh, Tom Laughlin. Would you still like to speak? Can you state your name and address for the record, please? Good evening. My name is Tom Laughlin. I live at 28038 North 130th Glen, also part of uh, Trilogy at Vistancia. Uh, just a couple of questions that uh, were partially answered, but I don't think they were clearly answered uh, in the presentation by the applicant. Uh, number one, one of the things that she had on her key points right there at the end was a line right down near the bottom that uh, talked about the timeline of this presentation. Now, obviously, I know it depends on how many people buy the lots and build houses, but is there some estimation of timeline for the north section and then a timeline for the uh, south portion? Um, the other big question that a lot of people that uh, live along the back wall of uh, Trilogy of Estancia, which I do, that look out over the abandoned uh, stone quarry is what does the applicant intend to do about mine remediation? Uh, I've walked back there. There's a big hole of a lot of chewed up rock and dirt, uh, and that is part of the site plan but they didn't address that at all in their, in their presentation. Uh, last but not least, um, I, I'm a little unclear on the plan to connect uh, on, the, on the discussion of Dynamite Road because uh, as far as I understand it, Dynamite Road just runs into the mountain there uh, east or west of uh, Trilogy of Estancia and is not completed. So to, to talk about that as an access or egress area, um, unless there's some plans to extend Dynamite Road um, uh, further to the, to the west, um, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, those are my questions, and uh, I appreciate the time. All right, we'll try to get some answers for you. Thank you for your comments and questions. Anybody else like to speak on this item? All right, um, we need you to fill out a speaker request form, but can we have them do that afterwards? All right, why don't we go ahead and have you come up and we'll have you fill out the form afterwards. If you can give your name and address for the record, please, that would be great. Uh, good evening, my name is Jim Wellis. I live in Vistantia at uh, a Trilogy of Vistantia, 13047 West Fetlock. So on your site map, I would be on the bottom right-hand corner of the southern square the southern parcel. 
and I'm on the perimeter so I can see out by back on my patio the development. So the first question is, when does the city believe that Dysart Road that's proposed would be completed all the way down to Joe, Joe Max? A, a, a quarter, what quarter of what year would that occur? And if and when it does happen, is it gonna be a two lane or a four lane highway? And lastly on that question, since I am at a lower elevation than that, probably around 60 or 70 feet, is it gonna have street lights? Because there are none there. I would probably not think they would because you don't have street lights on Vistantia Boulevard and it's pretty well developed, so. Second question, have there been any line of sight studies done from that particular area of, of uh, Trilogy? Are the single family, one story homes gonna obscure any of our line of sight for sunsets from our re residents? So I'm looking at the elevation of the rooftops on the single family homes. How high are they gonna be? Because they're already above our elevation level today. The last question, and this is probably the biggest, and I don't have any children here, living in Vistantia, but you got a big problem. I agree with this gentleman over here about working with the school district. There's four or five developers north of Lone Mountain. They've set aside parcels of land for the school district. I don't know of any f monies that have been given to the district. The district lost their appeal to raise their tax increase. So they're, they're, they're out. It's developer money or nothing. And the schools are way overcrowded. Lone Mountain Elementary, all the high school kids go to Liberty. That's a 20 minute drive across Happy Valley. You know this very well. And now you're gonna add 800 homes and another 600 homes north of Lone, Lone Mountain. That's a whole new elementary school. Where is it? Big problem. So I, I would petition you, ask the developers to work with the school districts with cash so they can build a district, a school district, a school up there. Because if you don't do it, you, you, it's gonna be tough to sell homes. Where are the kids gonna go to school? And that's it. Thank you, I'll fill out your app. Thank you for your comments and questions. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Did I see another hand? Sir, you wanna, um, I'll go to you next, sir, in the front. We're gonna start with you in the back. You had put, raised, raised your hand first. If I can get you to, again, state your name and address for the record. And then Good fill evening. out a form. I'm Joel afterwards. Resnick, and uh, we're located at 29283 North Sorrento. Um, we are proudly relocated here from Illinois. So um, kudos, we, uh, we love it out here. And, one of the reasons we love it out here is because we found a nice remote spot in the northwest corner of Peoria with dark skies and very little congestion, and that's all about to change. So before I get into my list of uh, concerns, um, one of the things that um, I just wanted to make note of is that there was, we, we moved out here just a few months ago. And uh, there was no disclosure in anything from Trilogy about a large development like this going up. There was a disclosure about the road uh, connecting um, Ridgeline being extended, but nothing about any large developments uh, in our area. We're basically located just north of Ridgeline and Dysart. So we're in the road that is called Upcountry in the Trilogy development. And right now we have a lot of nice, um, views and, and, and uh, which is what we were sold on, and at the same time, the congestion is very minimal. One of the things that is a big concern is the wildlife impact. Right now, there's lots of wildlife that comes through our area from those hills. Coyotes, javelina, you name it. What's gonna happen when all of this development starts and, there's no, and those animals get displaced? They're gonna be roaming the streets. They're gonna be all over. It's worse than it's gonna be than, than it is right now. So has there been any environmental or wildlife impact for those hills? Uh, again, the density, are you going to build roads before these homes are built so that there is access? 
Or are you going to build the homes and then decide, oh, let's put a road here and then the road's gonna go here and then just create the congestion with road construction while hundreds and hundreds of more people are trying to get out. The other big issue, and again, the main thing, one of the reasons we came this far out northwest, we didn't go to um, you know, Central Peoria or, 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 or Westbrook Village, is the, la the light the, or the limited light pollution. Right now, Ridgeline is very well lit. That extension that goes from Ridgeline across the northwest site to where that um, uh, turnabout is, is that going to be lit like the Vistancia Boulevard? Or are they gonna put these massive lights in that's gonna ruin everybody's night vision? Um, you know, these are some of the things that, again, people in Vistancia, people especially in Trilogy, moved away from all of that. We came out here for the quality of life. We came out here to be in a, in a, in a quiet, remote area. And now, again, it seems like all of that is changing. These were our dreams as retirees, and this is why we came out here. And everything to be situated this close to our homes, it's very troubling. So whatever you do decide to do, at least take that into consideration. If there needs to be more studies, like I said, with wildlife or animal habitat, please look into that as well as the school systems as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Okay, sir, uh, you're next. Good evening, I'm Lee Brown. I live at 27350 North 130th Lane. I live close to Mr. Willis there on the bottom. On the southern portion there, right backs up right to the, the applicant's development area. The, um, the water that the other gentleman um, mentioned, you know, is a concern that I had, not to a great extent, but you know, something I'd like to have considered. And in the applicant's other statement there, I was trying to justify the correlation of adding 832 plus homes to diminish or to ameliorate the traffic. I'm not sure I see the correlation on that. And if this does have to proceed, I think as the other gentleman just spoke, um, the dark sky concept right now probably impacted everybody at Trilogy that bought up to that area as that paying a premium of 100 to 200,000 for a lot that didn't back up to a golf course lights, street lights, et cetera. So I have new neighbors that have bought there in the last six months, next door, two doors down. This has been thrown in their lap and they're, they're kind of in a, in a quiz as to what's gonna happen and is their investment really as valuable as what they paid for? Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can I have you state your name and address for the record? And we'll have you fill out a form afterwards. Sherry Olson, uh, 27804 North 130th Glen in Trilogy of Estancia. So we moved here about three months ago. Um, and I've had, you know, I've heard these other comments and it's the same situation. Retirement home, dark skies, wildlife. Um, we asked if there was going to be any type of development before we bought the house. We were told by the city that there was nothing planned and that's clearly not the case. I think that the um, 75 foot buffer is insignificant and, and grossly inadequate for the wildlife that we see in our yard on our side of the trilogy fence. Uh, we have coyotes, we have javelinas, we have um, bobcats, um, hawks, quail, it's just, it's great. And the, um, the thought that we're gonna lose that is very disturbing. And I just would wish that you would take into consideration um, the people that live here already. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else like to speak on this matter? Going once. Oh, yes, sir. Got a lot of paperwork to do here, it looks like. <laughs> uh, Mark Sharpentier, I live at 27818 North 130th Glen Trilogy at Vistantia, very bottom part there uh, of the southern development. Uh, I, like Sherry, actually Sherry 
uh, and her husband, Doug, uh, lived next door to my wife, Linda, and I. Really interesting because did a due diligence, lived here a few months, and back in May, contacted the planning division, talked to two folks, it might have been Amanda, I've got to go find my notes on it. Uh, absolutely no development is going to be occurring in that area. And that's what we were told. Absolutely none. There was no ownership at that particular point or development plans that were on that. You know, uh, you know we know, you know, development's going to occur. I mean, it's just a fact of life. I grew up in Southern California, live in Oregon. And in Oregon, uh, we have a little bit more stringent uh, relative uh, to urban growth boundaries and how much we can and can't expand into those areas, which causes a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggregation of homes and that type of thing. Um, so this is very reasonable in many aspects of it relative to the amount of free space, although a lot of it is uh, concentrated in certain areas to the left that would be relatively uh, difficult to develop. My primary concern, one, first off, the not getting the disclosure, not getting the notices and those types of things were disconcerting to us, not sure what happened to those. Uh, so we weren't able to give some input in the beginning. But uh, this is a different development than what Trilogy at Vistancia is. So in, in the aspect of the separation, it is a, it's more than likely gonna be multifamily or at least uh, family uh, type of home. So we would expect that there's gonna be children and those types of things over there. You buy in a community where there's not children or on a limited basis, you wanna have a fair amount of separation between the two. So 75 feet is hardly adequate. Uh, the uh, 100 foot setback uh, for uh, two story homes, uh, that pretty much is probably gonna be uh, right next door to where we're at. So uh, two stories are probably gonna be looking down into our backyards that we thought were gonna be fairly private, uh, not so much. Uh, the wildlife, we do need to figure out how we, we're gonna make sure that wash is gonna have a lot of activity going through it, just like the wash within Trilogy. So how is that gonna be taken care of? How are they gonna be allowed to ingress, egress uh, within that community? Understanding that it is not gated, but still uh, cinder block walls do pr uh, prohibit them from, some of them, from being able to um, uh, migrate within that area. Uh, also very concerned relative to the traffic aspect of it, um, as to how those roads would be developed, how large those roads will be, how well lit they will be, and uh, what kind of uh, light pollution and noise will be coming from those relative to those of us that are in proximity to the development of those uh, particular roads. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk. Great, thank you, sir. Okay, any others who'd like to speak on this matter? Yes, sir. Come on up, state your name and address for the record, and uh, we'll have you fill out a form afterwards. <clears throat> My name is Larry Lestico, and I live at 13427 West Hummingbird Terrace, which is the very south part of the Trilogy West that abuts Ridgeline Road. Um, one of the issues in my mind here is, is that many of the lots that are presently within Trilogy have not been sold. So those people never receive a notice of these meetings. I never received the notice of the public hearing. The city that I came from, when they have hearings like this, put them on the web so that those people who can't make it to the meeting can at least hear what's said and offer their recommendations. It would be very nice if Peoria could do the same thing, given the huge geographical area. I also share the concern of the view lines and the placement of houses uh, immediately on Ridgeline Road of a two-story house, which will completely kill the views of anybody that lives right across Ridgeline on West Hummingbird Terrace. Has the developer agreed that they will not put two-story houses along that corridor? That's a question I would like to have answered. And I think that pretty much covers. Well, I'm concerned also at when that road will be completed. At this point in time, they which, have completed. Which road, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Which road are you speaking of? The extension of Ridgeline. Space extension of Ridgeline, okay. Uh, the westbound lane has been completed. The eastbound lane has been completed partially, but has not been completed because it's part of the Kali development. 
Those are my questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, sir. All right. Um, would anybody else like to speak? Going once. Going twice. All right. Uh, I'd like to invite the applicant back up uh, if you wouldn't mind addressing some of the concerns we heard tonight. I, I know there are a variety of them. I saw Susan taking up uh, notes there. I took some myself, but I'm hoping we can address at least some of the ones you heard uh, repeatedly. Uh, and then I'm going to ask the traffic engineer to okay. Talk a little bit about Ridgeline Extension, for instance, and some of the other road improvements that were, they've had questions about. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We're going to tag team this That's a little bit. Um, I'm going to go through my notes and try to answer some of the questions that I heard raised um, earlier. Uh, the first, I'd speak to the development timeline. We did neglect to address that in the presentation. Um, our expectation is that this moves forward to council approval um, next month is that we would start construction uh, at some point in May or June of this year um, with the first homes under, under construction a year from in 2021. Right. And, closings a year after. and closings a year after that. So we would start construction this summer of 2020. We would expect about 10 months after that that we would be ready. And so that would be the start of construction for the initial infrastructure. Um, about 10 months for that construction, and then we would start construction of homes that would put us into 2021 when we're starting construction of homes. And about a year after of that, we would expect the first homes to close in 2022. Um, the pace of home sales is expected to be about six to seven homes per month. And the North Parcel, which is the northern 120 acres that Mattamy will acquire first, um, would be built out probably over the course of four years. Um, the roadway improvements, if you look on the map that <clears throat> is up on the screen right now, um, the roadway improvements that we would construct during that first phase of development would include the extension and completion of Ridgeline. There's a roundabout and then 135th Avenue would go north to our property line. Um, we would then construct Dysart. Uh, with, by, by the time the north parcel is completed, Dysart will be constructed all the way down to Joe Max Road. Uh, the Dynamite Road uh, construction that was brought up, Dynamite will be um, constructed to our property line. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere at this point in time. The city's transportation master plan envisions that would expand in the future. Um, and let me address the mine quickly as well. Um, it's in the conditions of approval. It's addressed in the PAD. Uh, when we start pl development planning for the South Parcel, uh, we are required to prepare our mine reclamation plan that will be reviewed and approved by the city. Um, and that will you know, talk about how we're going to reclaim that area, what we're going to do with it, um, environmental impacts and things like that. We've started evaluating those options now, but that's a later phase of development, so that's not been finalized. We do expect the mine is likely going to remain as open space when the South Parcel develops. <clears throat> uh, let's see. As far as the configuration of the roadways, I heard a couple comments about streetlights. Um, you know, we will build these roads. These are all public roadways. They will be built to city of Peoria standards, um, and, you know, and, and that would in, that would typically include streetlights. Uh, you know, Joe Max, um, or I'm sorry, Dysart will initially be built as two lanes all the way down to Joe Max. There is a state trust land easement that exists today, and we will be building within that easement. It only is wide enough to allow for two travel lanes of, of traffic, but that is also based on our traffic analysis sufficient for the capacity, um, both of our uh, development as well as additional development that's expected over, you know, through the horizon year of that traffic study. Um, again, I think we did touch on this, the school district earlier, so I think you know where we stand on that front. Um, with, I do want to just touch back on the buffer that we've provided within the south parcel adjacent to Trilogy. That is identical to um, the buffer and the one-story home restrictions that the city of Peoria negotiated and imposed on the two developments 
that are north of us, so we're mirroring that. <clears throat> there is a 30-foot tract that exists on the uh, right behind the homes at Trilogy. There's a 30-foot existing tract that is part of the Vistancia Homeowners Association. <clears throat> so when you add our 75-foot open space buffer to that, you have a 105-foot corridor that will exist from wall, backyard wall to backyard wall. Um, and then our first row of homes along there will all be one story. We do not believe there will be any sight line issues because of those distances. Um, I'm going to try to stop now. <clears throat> sorry. You're a trooper. I'm going to let Hillary uh, <laughs> Sorry to put you through that, but I appreciate the information. It's helpful to, to everybody. I'll just jump in with a couple of comments about um, the wildlife issues. We've done our best on the site to leave those corridors open. Um, and anytime you're doing... Um, uh, a conservation subdivision of this sort, you want to make sure that those areas are the areas that are preserved because those um, corridors are where the wildlife tends to um, use as pathways. Um, so we're keeping those completely open. Um, the wildlife will still have um, ease of movement through the site um, as well as the hillside areas um, have, uh, we're not building anywhere over the 20% line, as Amanda said. Um, so those hillsides are will remain on site and open for the wildlife to use. In addition, we were required to prepare a DLCO report. And if you have it in your packet, you know how extensive that is. It's almost a thousand page document um, with soils reports, environmental reports, wildlife reports, um, all, you know, uh, saying that developing in this area could occur um, if it was sensitive to the um, existing landforms, and that's what we've prepared in this plan. Ryan, you want to touch on traffic? I'm Ryan Weed at Colin Van Lue Consultants. Our address is at 4550 North 12th Street in Phoenix. I wanted, I'm a civil engineer by trade, so I wanted to shed a little bit of light on a few of the gentlemen's questions regarding uh, water. Uh, water for the city of Peoria, the uh, city of Peoria is in a great situation relative to water. Uh, they're one of the few cities that have been, has been granted a 100-year assured water supply certificate uh, by ADWR. And so that means that the whole service area of the city of Peoria, which this project is a part of, um, has been granted a 100-year assured certificate. And so meaning that Peoria has already gone through extensive work with ADWR to prove up their uh, water supply uh, that it's that will be good for 100 plus years. Uh, in addition, this project will be bringing its own uh, water, so to speak, um, in that uh, for, you know, each home on a, just for water will be paying the, city, the required City of Peoria impact fees, which is approximately $5,700 per lot or per home when those homes are developed. Obviously, that fee has been established by the City of Peoria and goes to uh, meet uh, the overall water supply needs of, of the city, whether it's additional booster stations that are, need to be designed, additional wells that need to be drilled, acquisition of water from the CAP, all of that is a part of those fees. So we are you know, carrying our own water, quote unquote. Uh, in addition to that, other fees that are associated with the project are about $10,700, and those go for it to meet the needs of, of, of law enforcement parks as well as roadway improvements and, and the traffic needs that many residents or adjacent residents brought up. So all of those fees, development does pay for itself. And those, in, in, in addition to that, these roadways will be in place uh, as a part before, before the homes actually are, are, are constructed. So before the new residents uh, take ownership of their homes, those roadways will be in place to meet those traffic needs that are, you know, are anticipated by this project. I think that fills in all the rest of the gaps. If you could just remain up there, I want to ask the commissioners if they have any uh, follow-up questions for the applicant. See none. I had. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, we had one more thing to add. Yes. Um, just in terms of the general plan, that's the city's long-range planning document um, that basically says. Um, you know, in this 40-year chunk, what do we what do we want to do with this land? Um, both in the 2010 general plan and in the 2019 general plan update that was passed just last year, um, this land has always been designated for a residential use. Um, we haven't changed that. In fact, we've made it more restrictive with um, the Parks and Rec overlay. 
um, if if this that is a city document, um, if there was um, a need or want to change the density in that area, the future density in that area, um, you know, last year was a complete overhaul of the general plan. It could have been uh, reduced, but um, it, 2 point5 to five was what's been passed in the general plan, and we're coming down as low as possible within that category. Um, and with that, I guess we'd answer any further questions. I didn't think there were any questions, Commissioner. I had one regarding the light pollution uh, questions that were asked. Uh, tell me what measures we're taking to uh, maintain those dark skies out there, because I know that's a, a important feature to folks. So Mattamy Homes um, is completely in favor of uh, dark sky uh, compliant lighting, um, so they're uh, ready to sign on to that. In terms of the street lighting, that's a city of Peoria standard. Um, so we'll be build the roadways um, to those standards. Um, but in this area, I, I'm sure Chris can speak uh, more to this, but I believe there's a, a lower light standard for this area because it is dark sky compliant. Gotcha. Okay. All right, no further questions? Oh, he's got this timer on. Hmm? Is your thing not working? Oh, I have the timer up. I'm sorry, do you wish to speak? <laughs> sorry about that, Commissioner Hutchinson. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Thank you. My Thank, bad. You Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the, the scope of work at this uh, site. Uh, I know there's uh, hundreds of uh, homes uh, scheduled to be built. And uh, should you um, uh, receive the um, the go ahead on this uh, now or in the future. Um, I'd like the I'd like the developer to work with their contractors. I know um, I haven't seen um, too much success with this in in recent developments. Um, the city of Peoria has a has a vibrant youth program uh, that would um, be able to provide local residents local job opportunities to work on construction projects. I know construction workers are are typically not. Uh, first and foremost in the thoughts of developers and, and the employers they, uh, they hire, but um, we have a local workforce here that would, um, you know, we, we have a real problem in the West Valley. Um, over 70% of our residents travel east to go work at their profession. Um, and we have a development community here that um, I don't know that they're taking advantage of the resources that the city and local workforce groups and local labor groups can provide in providing jobs for those that live here in the community. Let them work on those on those same uh, projects in, within the their own community. So I'd like for the developer to work with their contractors directly with the contractors to make sure that we're using local resources to hire local people to do local work. Thanks, Chairman and Commissioner Hutchinson. I I. I Every uh, home builder association meeting that I attend, uh, labor shortage is either first or second on the agenda. Uh, so if, if there are, uh, if there's a strong labor force here in Peoria that is looking for um, work, I know that Madame will sign them up tomorrow. I'm certain to get them on their their books. Uh, a contractor uh, labor shortage is something that's very it's a top priority for the home builder association of Central Arizona, and I'm certain that if uh, there was a strong labor force here that's um, uh, specialized in those areas, they'll be happy to have them in, uh, enlisted on this project. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Patterson, you had a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to ask staff to confirm how long this area has been shown as residential on general plan for how many years? So, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, members of the commission, so the we, we, uh, the general plan was mentioned a little while ago. So that's the that's the city's long range plan for how it uh, the desired land uses and how it intends to build into the future. We've had a general plan going back to the 1970s. Um, the land up in this area wasn't annexed really until the uh, 1990s, largely near the lake. Uh, Vistance wasn't really annexed until the late 1990s. But our general plan um, we've had in place all this time in, in the 90s, which this area has always been designated for a single family residential designation with the wash quarters and hillsides as park open space. So the general plan has been in place uh, really for all that period of time. The general plan covers all land throughout the city of Peoria, the jurisdictional boundary, including what we call our planning area. And these are areas that we expect someday 
to be part of the city through annexations. Yeah, so this is not new information that this is going to be residential. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. And to be clear, no multifamily, right? I mean, this is what's being proposed here is all single family homes. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, yes, this is just single family. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Commissioner Alsop, you have a question? Uh, really more uh, a comment uh, than anything. Um, I heard a lot of comments about staff, and I want to express my full confidence in the city staff. I don't think they're asleep at the wheel. Um, they have done a fantastic job. I have a lot of exposure to them both here in the commission and in my professional life. And in my professional life, I could say they're not easy. And I live in Peoria, so I'm grateful for that. Um, they do a fantastic job, and we rely on them for their work. Uh, a lot of the issues were addressed that I had some comments on. Uh, lastly, uh, I wanted to make a comment on Cali properties or the current landowner. And we heard a lot of conversations today about other landowners' rights. And um, I want to highlight that the owner of the property today was there before Vistancio was there. They have landowners' rights as well. And for that reason and the fantastic job that they've done with this PAD, um, I'm looking forward to supporting this. Thank you, Commissioner Alsaba. Commissioner Fighter, you have a question. Yeah, um, I, I assume this was, and I don't know if staff remembers offhand, but would, would this uh, zoning designation for this piece of property be outlined in the public report for Vistancia and Trilogy in, th in theory? Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Fighter, that would be correct. Yep. Okay. okay. Any other questions or comments before I close out the public hearing? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Before I do, I, I want to look to our engineering staff. Is there anything you want to uh, close the loop on regarding uh, road extensions, lane widths, uh, lighting, any of the, hmm? lighting. lighting uh, the light pollution issue? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, anything you can address as well? So you probably heard those questions. Thank you, Chair <clears throat> and Commissioners. I made some notes. Uh, hopefully I can address most of the questions. Um, so I'll just start with what I have. Let's talk about lighting. Uh, so, um, Mr. Gleason, can you go to an overall map on, on the screen, please? Or, or is that it? Yeah. What's it? Just uh, what we had before that showed the arterials. That's good. Thank you. All right. So if you, if you look at the map that's on your screen, everything in red, so that, that's Ridgeline Road, that's going to be Dysart, those are classified as arterials. In this case, they're minor arterials. And so the ultimate width of that would be 110 feet of right away, two lanes in each direction with the raised median is the ultimate configuration. We may flare it out at the major intersections that allow for right turns and maybe dual less, but I don't see it in this area. And so because those are major arterials, we have certain lighting standards based on volumes and speeds to, to enhance the driving, because the headlights of the vehicle only go for some distance. So there's natural standards to light up an arterial. And so we're gonna follow those standards for the arterials, which is Ridgeline and Dysart. When you get into the residential neighborhood, you know, the local roads, the collector roads, there's an opportunity to go dark, dark sky and a, a lesser lighting level uh, if the developer chooses to do so. But we're gonna follow our standards on our major arterials because there's a lot of liability associated with that if we don't have the correct lighting levels on these roads. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, let's talk about Joe Max Road. Um, so there was a concern that the timing of the extension of Joe Max, especially from Vistancia over to, let's call it El Mirage. And so was out 20, 30 or later. And that I wasn't up front in my explanation earlier. And so it, um, if you recall, I mentioned that a lot of that's going to be dependent on development when that extension is made. The reason why 2030 came up, and this was in a meeting, uh, we have uh, my director, who's Adina Lund. She meets with the Trilogy uh, community quite a bit and, and gives updates really on what projects are going on, and, and this question gets asked. The reason why 2030 comes into play is because that's on the outside of our 10-year capital improvement program. 
We've programmed projects out 10 years. We're in 2020, so we're programming up to 2030. We haven't identified that extension of Joe Max to be constructed in our capital improvement program yet. Because we don't know when development comes in. And if we, if we program the money to build that section of Joe Max, we're taking it away from another project and may not be needed in 10 years. However, if development is, is going to occur fast, that's why we look at our, our capital improvement projects every year and have an opportunity to modify the projects. If there's a need, we would enter that project into the capital improvement program, and, and we have to have a balanced program. Uh, there's only so much funds to build capital projects. Uh, but that will be, at that time, considered. And, we, and this, is, this happens quite a bit. I, we, we may not know where future signal traffic, I'll give you an example. Um, Ridge Line of Vistancia, uh, where I mentioned we're putting in a traffic signal. We, I, we've been working with Vistancia Development Group quite a bit to identify signal needs in that community. And we identified two right now that we need to put in, Vistancia and Ridge Line and Low Mountain and El Mirage. They weren't programmed in our capital improvement pro, um, CIP program initially, but we identified the need, we're designing them, and we're going to be working with Stances to get those two traffic signals up and running probably next year. So that's what happens with these programs is we don't know if it's 10 years out. If, it, if it's earlier, we'll program it. If it's later, depending on development and the speed of the homes going up, uh, then it doesn't need to be in the 10-year CIP. It'll be programmed later. So that's why 2030 is kind of the, the number we're saying because that means it's outside our CIP at that time. Doesn't mean we're, we're forgetting, we, we did a DCR a concept of it. We know there's a need. We identified it in our impact fee structure. So if, if there's a developer that comes in and they build the road, they're going to get impact fee credits. So we identified the need that there's that connection that needs to be made. Also, 135th Avenue going up to uh, Low Mountain has been identified in this area also. Not Cali's responsibility, but if there's a development that occurs north, of Cali, north of Haciendas, towards a, a low mountain, we'd be maybe looking at making that connection also. Those are the things, long range planning that we do on transportation. Um, so one thing I want to identify for the Cali development is they prepared a traffic study per our standards. We've, they're doing all their haps, typically we ask for half street improvements adjacent to where they're building, which is a lot of roadway arterials. We've asked for more than what we typically would from a developer. We asked them to take Dysart away from their property uh, to Joe Max. They don't own that land. That's not next to their, but we said, you know what, we need this. And working with them, we identified a trigger. Not, it's not day one when they start building, but when they get to that dynamite alignment, we say, okay, at that time, we really need to go south. We can't really want, we don't want everybody going to Vistancia and Ridgeline to get to this development. And that was the trigger and those, are the conditions of, of approval from the traffic engineering perspective that we worked out. I, we must have been working on this for over a year to, to figure out the traffic issues and the needs. Um, and then there was a question about dynamite. Why, why are we extending dynamite? It does, is it going to go to the west? Dynamite is the, the roadway between the north section of Cali and the south section of Cali. And if you look at the uh, exhibit on your screen, and if you see a little blue line going to the north parcel, that's the secondary way in and out of that parcel. You, so you come off Dysart is one way to access the parcel. The second way is using dynamite. And our goal, working with the applicant, was find two ways in and out of every single parcel in case one gets blocked for some reason. There's another way in and out of those parcels. And so that's why we're looking at dynamite, and, and that's why it's needed. Also, it does provide access to developable land, maybe not a lot, to the west, even though you're going to run into some hillside stuff, there could be potential that someone wants to develop a few lots back there, so there will be that opportunity to use Dysart. Um, I, I believe I got all the questions um, on my notes. Did it's all the ones anything? that I had, unless there's any I'm forgetting. Commissioners, remind me, but I think you got them all. Very good. Thank you. Thank you Appreciate that additional information. I think that was very helpful. Chairman Nelson, just yes. to make a point, um, mm -hmm. I find it concerning that residents might find that staff intentionally left anyone out of the public participation process. Um, so I just want to address some concerns 
Because this application took such a long time from submittal to actual public hearing, staff went through the process to update all of the addresses when we sent out the public hearing postcard um, in the off chance that parcels were sold from the HOA or the developer to actual residents. Uh, so for this property, given the size of the rezoning, the notification radius, unless an individual asked to be an interested party, is a quarter of a mile. And then we also notify HOAs within one mile. Um, part of that process, so we pull those addresses from Maricopa County Assessor data. And what that is, is we send it to the mailing address for the property owner. It is not the property address because we do have residents who are only part-time residents. And so if they aren't in state, they won't receive a notice. Um, I did have one particular individual who said that she did not receive a notice and I knew from looking up her address that she should well be within the radius and so I supplied her with the mailing address that was on file with Maricopa County Assessor's Office and what she found is that the mailing address for the trust that her property was in the title ownership for was actually out of date. So if an address is not updated with Maricopa County Assessor, we aren't able to know where to send the postcard. We only send to the information that we are provided by the assessor's office. So it's definitely not an intention to ever leave a resident out of the, the participation process. And it's also why we have the applicant post the site and host a neighborhood meeting. Thank you for that clarification. I, I appreciate that. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, if I can make an additional point too yes. about notification. I, I just, yeah. I do want to mention that we updated our notification requirements probably five, six years ago, and we are among the most expansive in the valley. The state statute requires a 300 foot notification. We go quarter mile based on the size of this project and all HOAs within a, within a mile. I don't think you can find another jurisdiction in, in the valley, Maricopa County, that have uh, the notification requirements as stringent as ours. Thank you, Matt. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Hutchinson, you have a comment or a question? Uh, I just wanted to echo uh, Commissioner Alsop's uh, uh, accolades of the staff. In fact, we, uh, there was a comment about not being able to make a meeting or the proximity of the city. I have an opposition to the project right here. It was given to us at late notice, back January 15th. Uh, the, op the opposition was filed with the, with the commission here. I, you know, they don't. They don't just notify the residents in the area. I mean, I got the notification of my house because I s sit on this board. Um, so the, the the communication from the city and the work that's put into a, a project like this. Um, you, you, I know a lot of you are kind of newer residents. You're in a very very well run city, and and they do everything they can to communicate um, projects like this and, um, and items like this. I know I work. I I moved here about 25 years ago to a dark sky neighborhood at 91st Avenue in Union Hills. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and but, uh, you know, and, I'd, and, and wide open lot behind me, I used to watch the sunset too, and I, I know it's, it's just being a part of a growing city. Um, you guys are in one of the best cities in the country, and um, it's been rated as that for quality of life, uh, well managed. Um, you know, the cost of living here, it's just a great place to either retire or raise your family like I've done. Um, I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. All right, any further comments, questions? All right, okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be taking action on the general plan amendment and the rezoning request separately. Um, are any further questions or comments from commissioners on the general plan amendments specifically before I request a motion? This would be GPA 19-02. Okay, seeing none, may I have a motion? Oh, Commissioner Hutchinson. I, I did have one more comment, yes, and, it, and it's... And it's regarding the, um, the, the, the school and the traffic. Um, I'm really having a lot of trouble right now at this point getting behind this project. I know the work that goes into this is incredible and that the, the staff does a really good job and I know the developer, I, I know they, they put a lot of thought into the design. My, my wife teaches at Liberty. She has 38 kids in her class and the Meadows is not even a fraction done right now. And that was one that we were concerned about at the time, about the overcrowding of, of Liberty at that time. To, to, to think that we're gonna ship 
another 10 miles worth of kids into Liberty. I, I really, at this time, I just, I can't do that. This Liberty is the closest school with certified teachers for high school to this entire area. And I know it's not the, in the city's purview and it's, it's really not the city's fault that this is the case. It's a dysfunctional system that we have in the state. And I know so I'm, I'm from New York, right? I mean, we had good schools everywhere. And, um, you know, when I moved out here, the good, they were good schools too. They, they, they are good schools, but there's just not enough of them. And, and that's, I cannot, in my good conscience, I can't go home tonight, as a matter of fact, if I sit here and say, yeah, uh, honey, you got 800 more families going to send their kids to your classroom. And I, and I really want a solution um, uh, for the school problem uh, before I can, I could, I could get my, I could get behind a project like this. It just, it just doesn't happen. So I'm sorry. That's, that's. All right. The request for motion is still there. Uh, did anybody like to make a motion to approve or not? Mr. Chair, I motion that we approve item 5R, Milo John Employment GPA 19-02 to City Council. All right. Commissioner, we have a, a motion on the table. Do I have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval of case GPA 19-02 to City Council. This is, again, the general plan amendment. Uh, any further comments or questions before I ask for the vote? Okay, please vote. And it passes six to one, the general plan amendment. Next, we're going to move on to the rezoning request specifically. Uh, any further questions or comments for commissioners before we take action on case Z19-02? All right, seeing none, may I have a motion? Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, I recommend we approve item 6R rezone Z-1902 to city council subject to conditions of approval. Thank you, Commissioner Alsop. We have a motion to recommend approval. Uh, do I have a second? I'll, I'll second. Commissioner Fighter seconds. Okay, we have a motion and a second to recommend approval of KZ19-02 to city council. Commissioners, please cast your vote. And it passes 6-1. Thank you, commissioners. All right, we're going to move on to our next item, and that is 7-R, Cobblestone Express Car Wash. But before we do, do we mind if we take a five-minute break? All right, I'm going to adjourn for a five-minute break. <clears throat>
So if folks want to continue conversation out in the lobby, we'd appreciate it. All right, we're going to go ahead and begin. Um, the next item up is item 7R, Cobblestone Express Car Wash, rezoning case Z93-10A-11. Request to amend the Fletcher Heights plan area development to allow a standalone car wash facility as a permitted conditional use uh, at 8268 West Deer Valley Road. Uh, staff, would you please present your report? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good evening. Uh, tonight's application, as the chair mentioned, is a rezoning to the Fletcher Heights PAD. Uh, the applicant is M3 Design on behalf of Cobblestone Auto Spa. The location is on the northeast corner of 83rd, Alley and De 83rd Avenue and Deer Valley Road, which is the specific site, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But uh, as you stated, the proposal is to amend the PAD to allow a standalone car wash as a conditional use. Um, not going to go over this again after you, you stated that, but basically uh, no changes to the zoning are being made other than the addition of the language about the car wash. The property will remain within the Fletcher Heights PAD, and uh, it will still be a conditional use if this amendment is approved. If you can see here at the uh, on the zoning map before you, the site is in question that the car wash is desired is at the corner of West Deer Valley Road and North 83rd. Three of the corners at this intersection are developed with large uh, commercial retail um, businesses. The site is part of the larger uh, marketplace at that location. Across the street is a Walgreens that's on C2. And then there's a restaurant behind the Walgreens. And then across the intersection, another property is on C2 where the Fry's Marketplace is and the McDonald's. And the uh, existing plaza that this site exists in is the Deer Valley Marketplace and has anchored by an Albertsons and there's a jack-in-the-box. Uh, most of you be familiar with this property. It used to be a Valero gas station. The gas station has been out of business for some time. And the proposal is to amend the language of the PAD to allow for a standalone car wash. Um, to give you a little bit better context, as I mentioned, this is the vacant Valero gas station. To the north of the property are, is phase two of the Fletcher Heights residential PAD. To the west across the street is the Walgreens and the DV83 project. To the south across Deer Valley Road is the Fletcher Heights phase 1A residential area. And then to the east through the marketplace site sort of behind that, the marketplace to the east is also the residential homes as part of phase 2A of Fletcher Heights. Uh, these 
lots range in these areas from around eight to I believe around 13,000 square feet lots. Uh, staff analysis for this project, the existing PAD language would allow car washes in conjunction with gas stations. So if you, if you follow the language of the PAD, uh, it, it did mention the word car washes, but due to the ambiguity of the language, we felt it prudent to, to have the applicant request this application because what's going to occur is that the Valero is going to be completely torn down and the applicant desires to place a standalone car wash on the property. And the previous language uh, would not have allowed a standalone car wash, only car washes in conjunction with a convenience store. So that's the distinction. The ordinance uh, would allow car wash facilities on properties, zone C2 with a conditional use permit. So the, the older PAD language of Fletcher Heights referred to PC2. Uh, staff believes that PC2 and C2 are similar in nature. And when you uh, consider the fact that the three corners of the four are zoned, uh, are two, the other two corners are zones C2, those large commercial centers would allow a standalone car wash. And staff believe that the site characteristics of the Deer Valley Marketplace are similar enough to what those parcels are that we could, uh, you know, we could recommend approval of a standalone car wash at this site. Uh, it's important to note that even if this amendment is granted, that the conditional use permit will still be necessary. Um, one other uh, aspect of this is that the, uh, the amendment to the PAD, although we've highlighted this particular site, there is one other large commercial plaza that's sort of in the southern part of Fletcher Heights that in theory could have a standalone car wash if this application passes. I'm not saying that there's, you know, there's, we don't have any, an application before us, but the impact to the, it would be to the entire PAD for the commercial areas. So you could have a standalone car wash anywhere within the commercial areas of the larger PAD. Uh, this, we believe that the CEP and the site plan process will allow us and the commission to mitigate site specific concerns. So in other words, we feel comfortable recommending this because there's going to be a CEP with the opportunity to weigh in on you know, noise, dust, odor, the traditional site characteristics that we typically see through these types of applications. Uh, as far as public outreach, uh, pretty standard uh, for a rezoning application. Notification was made to a 600 feet radius and all registered HOAs within a mile. A legal ad was published in the newspaper and the site was posted by the applicant. They did hold a neighborhood meeting at Sunset Heights Elementary on de December 3rd and there was one attendee. As far as public comment received, and it is in your packet, the email was in your packet, we did receive one email in opposition. The email, uh, if, if you all read it, it, it corresponded mostly to general traffic concerns. It was not, I wouldn't say it was directly related to the car wash per se, it was more of just a general assessment of traffic. Uh, the one thing that I would mention is that the trip generation rates for a standalone car wash are about half of what a, a convenience store is. So in reality, although probably fairly minor, the sort of teardown of the old Valero and replacement with this uh, car wash would be a reduction in traffic. Small, but at least it, would, it would not be an increase, it would be a reduction in traffic based on trip generation. Uh, the key findings are that we find that the amendment to the PAD is in conformance with the general plan and the zoning ordinance. And uh, from a sort of planning perspective, we just felt that the specific location in question is in keeping with the general land use pattern of the area and the commercial land use category. As I mentioned previously, if you, if you, if you picture those, the sort of the four corners of the 83rd Avenue and the Deer Valley Road intersection, you have three large sort of areas of commercial activity with two being zone C2 and then the commercial PAD portion of Fletcher Heights. So we felt as a staff and through discussions with the applicant that um, it, it's sort of a continuation and, and a, 
not necessarily fairness, but it's they're similar parcels. So if the Fry's parcel wanted to have a standalone car wash or the Walgreens side of the street wanted to have a standalone car wash, they would be allowed through a CUP, but the C2 zoning district would permit that. Uh, with that, with those findings, we do recommend approval of case Z93 10A.11 to the City Council, and you can find the conditions of approval in Exhibit 1 of your staff report. Great. Thank you for your report, Mr. Clayhorn. Um, any commissioners have any questions um, of staff regarding this item? None? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Fighter, you have a question. Sorry, I was a little slow to the button. So, so if I understand correctly, if they were current rights for the property owner, they can open a they can open a car wash if they reopen the gas station currently. That is correct. So the the if the the existing language would permit a car wash as sort of a conjunctionary use with a, a service station. So let's say they tore down the Valero or they so a gas station reopened the Valero and they wanted to build a, a car wash as sort of a, you know, when you see gas stations that have a car, a smaller car wash as an accessory, they would be able to do that. The request is being made because the language is somewhat unclear in the way that this somewhat older PAD is written, that it, it does mention the word car wash, but this will clarify the language, this will make it clear for both us and the applicant, and we felt that with the CUP still required that it was a valid use of the review. Does that answer your question? Perfect. All right, Commissioner Hutchinson, you have a question. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so <clears throat> when they move forward with this, are they going to be required to remove the, the tanks, the underground tanks for the call, uh, from the gas station? Commissioner Hutchinson and through the chair, uh, I didn't mention that the CUP and the site plan are, all, are they're both in review right now. Obviously, we don't, we, you know, they don't move forward until this rezoning or this PAD amendment takes place. While I'm not a mediation expert, I'm certain that that would be part of the, you know, the state EPA and their requirements. I, I, I used to work in a similar industry, and I know that. Uh, that that would more than likely be the case. I can't imagine that they would be able to build this over the top of those tanks. Mr. Hawkins, were you wanting to add something? Mr. Chairman, I was just going to confirm that to, to redevelop the site, they would have to remove the tanks and remediate the site. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, any further questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Is the applicant present tonight? Thank you. May I... Uh, Get your name and number. Or Absolutely. Name and address, right, Chair. Record. Good evening. Jesse Macias, M3 Design, 1415 North 7th Avenue, Phoenix, Arizona, 85007. Um, thank you again. Um, I want to first and foremost thank uh, Jason and Steph again uh, for all of their hard work for this. Um, believe it or not, this has kind of been in the works for over a year. Um, and again, this is um, wasn't working with Jason back when we first um, inquired about this location and maybe it was a matter of a miscommunication or what have you. This, we had the understanding that this was an approved use and, and we were going through the site plan design review and, and so forth. Um, later we came forth when we had our pre-app that it actually, um, we needed to rezone um, and, and, and you know sometimes development doesn't fa go as fast as our client would like. Uh, the rezone part of it kind of, I think just had concerns for our, our landlord if you will, because um, every, everybody thought that the, the car wash was an approved use as part of the Fletcher. But nonetheless, you know, um, after discussion with, with uh, my client, Cobblestone, we understood completely with staff and um, that we would first and foremost rezone uh, the PAD, which establishes the language, and then we would then come back then and do the CUP, uh, which again, we submitted all three of them at the same time, pretty much knowing that CUP and site plan is still there on hold, if you will. So again, it adds the language to the Fletcher Heights, and, and, but it also gives the city and commission, city council, another opportunity if a future car wash were to come in under Fletcher Heights, the opportunity to go through a CUP, which would be a completely separate, and it would, it would be reviewed and approved on its own merits or, or not approved. So I just want to make a, make a point of that. Um, so again, um, I did want to uh, indicate that <clears throat> 
our landlord is actually already in the process of removing the tanks. They, they have actually gone through all the processes with ADQ and state. So I, the, the tanks, I th believe, will be removed in about two to three weeks. So all of that remediation and the tank removal, and, and I'm not sure if they have you know, have any permits that have to go through the city or not, but um, I am telling you that, that directly from our seller, they're already in the process or, or, or about to actually start pulling the, the tanks. Um, and again, we're just um, we're replacing the oval arrow. I'm not really sure how, how many years that's been vacant. Obviously, it's an eyesore. Um, we are, as Jason mentioned, we did a traffic study, and um, we're not we're not really a destination um, site, if you will, compared to a gas station or a C store. So actually, our we kind of take advantage of the traffic that's already there. Our our percentage is actually increase of 25 percent. Um, and so again, as Jason mentioned, the traffic volumes per the traffic generation study would, would actually uh, diminish. Um, one of the things that we've worked with staff was they required or requested us to um, increase the throat on the Deer Valley curb cut. Um, and, and let me go to the, and I apologize, um, to the site plan very quickly. I don't know if this has a pointer. Does it have a pointer? So, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, sorry for the interruption. If I, if I could, the uh, the item tonight is to consider adding language that would um, uh, clarify that uh, if, if approved, it would allow a uh, car wash in this zoning district. As we've mentioned, um, if it's approved, it would have to still come back as a conditional use permit. And in that manner, we would be looking at the specifics of the site plan, including all the operational and physical characteristics. And there would be another public hearing before the Planning Commission. Tonight, we're just considering the uh, entry of language to clarify the use of, uh, of the PD allowing a car wash. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. And I, and I, am I, I may be getting ahead of myself with, with the Probably. specifics of the project. But, but again, um, we, we understand that obviously this is a, a, a the, the verbiage and the language for the PAD, knowing that we're going to come back in front of you and for the CUP. And again, right. we're excited about our <clears throat> development here. Um, we did have the neighborhood meeting, and then we also had um, back right before Thanksgiving a meeting with Council Member Edwards um, and and Miss uh, Terry Smith. So that was one of the requests that we meet with them, and 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 we felt that we left that meeting um, <clears throat> clarifying any concerns that they may have and so forth. They Council Member Edwards really wanted to find out what the neighborhood meeting um, results were, which again, one neighbor was there. So again, I would, um, I could answer any other questions. Again, I'll, I'll be in front of you again with the specifics of it. Great. Um, do any commissioners have any relevant questions at this time? I think we're good. Thank you. Uh, we do have one speaker request form uh, from Teresa Weist. 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 Sorry about that. If you come up, please, and state your name and address for the record, and uh, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good evening. I live in Fletcher Heights, and I live right behind that particular shopping center on the northeast corner. And I was interested to hear about the meeting that they had one attendee. I didn't know about the meeting. And I found out only this afternoon about it, that it was going to be tonight. And I talked to about five neighbors and got their signatures. They were all against it. So I don't know about the notification um, process, and I appreciate that they did that. But anyway, what my feeling is, is that particular shopping center is smaller than the ones on the other corners. And it wasn't um, originally zoned for that. And as I understand it, the new car wash that they plan to put there will have larger blowers and bigger equipment than one that would be attached to a gas station. So there will be more noise for the neighbors. When we purchased our home, it's a quiet, serene neighborhood. And we just want to keep it like that. Um, the traffic at that corner is very busy, but I don't know that a, 
a car wash would affect the traffic at all. I'm more concerned about the noise and what it will do to that particular little neighborhood shopping center. Right now there's an Albertsons and um, other small stores that have like a nail salon and just other neighborhood stores. So a, a big car wash will, and I understand it's gonna be really tall and really loud. So those are my concerns. Um, if you rezone it, I think it was zoned that way initially because it's smaller and it's closer to the homes. So the noise will affect us. And I really appreciate you listening and at the last minute coming in. But I do have signatures from other neighbors. And I don't know if it's possible to put it off to another meeting where the neighbors can really give you our opinion. I would appreciate that because I think there's a lot of neighbors that have concerns. So if you have any questions of me, I'd be happy to answer. I don't think so. I think we're good, though. I appreciate your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yes, I'm going to have the applicant come back up and see if he can address yeah, some I'd of like those concerns you raised. about the noise level, please. Yeah. And it's more of an industrial type thing, and there are two large car washes in the area over on Lake Pleasant. Okay. Already there. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for being here tonight. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, again, I'm not really sure the notification. We, we, we actually received the, the we, we sent out the notifications per the guidelines um, of the city of, of Peoria. And again, I'm not really sure what exactly happened, but, but we had an affidavit of notification. Regarding the noise, um, the lot coverage, just to very, not to get into specifics, but the lot coverage of our building is, is about 25% less, believe it or not, of what the sea store and the, and the fuel canopy were. So our, our portion of the lot coverage is less than what was there. And Cobblestone, I've been working with them over 21 years, this express, we put all our equipment, all our blowers inside the tunnel, all, all our vacuum motors are inside the tunnel versus other car wash operators. Usually put them on the outside because it's a lot less expensive, if you will. Um, so we put everything on the inside with its own building so um, there is no motors. When you go out there and vacuum at the, at the different stations, there's literally no, no noise other than, you know, if you pick up a penny or what have you. So there is no motors like you would if you had a standard car wash um, attached to a gas station with vacuums on the outside. Um, the decibel levels, we've done many studies, and the decibel level is, is, is because everything self-contained is a lot less than you would have on the street, uh, the decibel level, which is, I believe, about 95 decibels, I believe. So, um, so again, one of the things is that we always do is we, we make sure that we want to be a good neighbor, and the last thing we want is to have noise. Uh, we want to mitigate noise. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Strakos, I got a quick question. Did I understand you correctly that this project will come back more specific? There'll be another opportunity for public participation when we look at this one more time? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, so, so these are two separate applications. So yeah. tonight, we're just considering whether we want to um, amend the planetary development zoning to allow a car wash as a standalone use. Separately, there is a conditional use permit process wherein we look at the specific layout of the site. We look at all the attributes of the operation, including noise, uh, circulation, lighting, odor, all those kind of things are all part of the conditional use permit. There would be another public hearing in front of the planning commission where we would uh, take action on the conditional use. For the car wash to sell, okay. So it's like there'll be another opportunity. Um, if we can get your name and address before you leave, we can make sure that you're on the notification list as well. Um, you can get that to uh, Ms. Ernest or Mr. Clayhorn here at the front. Yep. Either one. All right. Um, at least one of us. Okay. Let me switch over here. All right. We've got a couple of questions from, um, are they of the applicant? Um, or, no more staff then. We staff? Uh, staff. Well, go, go ahead and uh, we'll keep the public hearing open at this time. Uh, we'll start with you, Commissioner Atluski. Okay. What are your questions? So you have? I am going to cross over from what we're doing tonight to what might be the future. Um, the rules and setbacks for a, a large car wash versus what would be a very small, if they put it on the back of a gas station, 
Am I to assume that they meet any minimum setbacks from housing or from other identities so that when they do come back to us, we're not then looking at a case where they're, they're asking for zoning variances to do it? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the, the conditional use permit uh, application doesn't enable uh, a, any request to to uh, change standards of the PED. So it's not, uh, you, you couldn't change standards through that vehicle. Um, the PED already has setbacks in place that address commercial to residential and from uh, buildings to the street line. So there's already those standards in place. So if the car wash was to come in, we would uh, evaluate the application to make sure it met all the current standards. Okay. All right, because that's my concern as we go through the exercise of doing it tonight, but then run into something in the future. And, and I appreciate your comments about Cavalstone and how they've uh, tried to minimize the, the noise uh, with two major roads I, I got to believe it's going to blend a lot into the traffic noise, uh, but that was my concern. I just don't want us to come back in a month or two and go, oh, wait a minute, it doesn't match. So thanks for that. Commissioner Fighter, you had a question as well? Yeah, quick question. As, as, assuming this gets approved today and the applicant comes back for the CUP, will there be another neighborhood meeting requirement of, of the applicant? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I believe the uh, neighborhood meeting was held to address the uh, condition use permit because that was submitted uh, initially along with a site plan. And then they were advised that, whoa, you know, you actually need to amend the zoning too. So there was a neighborhood meeting that addressed the zoning aspect of it and the condition use permit. Additionally, the roster of notification would have gone to the same radius for notification. So the notification radius would have been the same distance. Okay. Okay. Any other further questions of applicant or staff? Mr. Chairman and members of the board, um, let me just clarify one other thing. With the CUP requirement, there is the opportunity uh, that if we receive notification uh, during the time frame for the CUP, we can ask for a second neighborhood meeting. So that is an option uh, that is available. Okay. Sorry, it looked like you wanted to do it at something? Just or? one thing that mm -hmm. it may be relevant, and we are replacing a what was a 24-hour convenience operation, and we're not 24-hour. So, so we are, you know, we close at 8 p.m. So, again, from a neighborhood standpoint, we do, we're replacing an old 24-hour operation. Okay. That's a good clarification. Oh, sorry, you, you wanted to do, ask a follow-up question? I, I'll allow you to come up. We still have the public hearing open. Um, do you just have a brief question? My concern is if you pass it tonight for the rezoning, it will be available for anybody to do a car wash. And I would just ask you would just give us a few weeks to let the neighbors respond and then have this vote if that's possible. Because we haven't, we haven't had a chance to respond in the neighborhood. Okay. So I appreciate that. Thank right, you. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else in the audience want to comment on this issue? Or? Seeing none, I am going to close the public hearing. All right. Um, any further questions or comments from the commissioners on this rezoning request before I uh, request a motion? Commissioner Lusky. Yes, so just so I, uh, I'll be happy to, oh, go ahead. You know, I have a question. So, yeah, I'll be happy to make a motion for approval knowing, uh, and I want to make sure I want a clarification that it could include a requirement for a, a new mailing to be sent and a new meeting to be held on it. Is that what you said? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, just to be really clear, so the action tonight um, is, as you know, is to make a recommendation to the city council. This item still has to go to the city council for final action. That it will be, I believe, sometime in February. I think it's the, uh, the 18th of February. It would have to go to city council. This is another opportunity to speak to the council. Mm -hmm. Separately, there's, there's going to be a conditional use permit tracking where we'll unpack all the attributes of a, of a car wash. It'll come to this body. Okay. I, yeah, because I just want to make sure that the neighbors have had their chance to, to voice their opinion. I, I'm, I'm in agreement with this project, but I just I want to make sure that you know she was heard and that 
there'd be an opportunity in the future and it makes sense. Thanks. That makes sense to you. This is a recommending body. So we rec make a recommendation to city council and they make the final decision. So, and that'll be about a month from now. So it sounds like there'll be opportunities for those neighbors to uh, appeal to the city council. Okay, uh, any other further questions or comments before I call for the motion? No. All right, may I have a motion? Okay, yeah, I'll make that. I'll make a motion that we, uh, we move forward uh, Cobblestone Express Car Wash Rezoning Z93-10A.11 to the City Council for approval. Thank you, Commissioner Arluski. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval to City Council of Case. Uh, get this right. Is it Z93-10A.11? Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, commissioners, please cast your vote. And it's seven, uh, seven votes to none, uh, recommending approval. Thank you, everybody. All right, our next item discussion, our next item for discussion is, is 8R. This is limitations on uses, zoning ordinance text amendment TA19-03. This is a privately initiated text amendment to amend section 21-505.A.5 of the zoning ordinance with regard to the limitations associated with gas stations and the related accessory equipment adjacent to residentially zoned property. Staff, please present your report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you mentioned, this is TA 1903, a zoning ordinance text amendment on 21-505 limitations of use regarding gas service stations. The applicant who is present tonight is Bertrand Cracciolo on behalf of Quick Trip. Um, as you mentioned, uh, typically text amendments that our planning division uh, reviews from time to time are either one of two sort of varieties. Uh, as you all are familiar, there are often text amendments that are sort of staff driven that we bring to you. I know that there was one fairly recently for the Platt language. And then also the, app, the zoning ordinance provides applicants an opportunity to privately initiate text amendments um, to the zoning ordinance. And, and that's what you have before you tonight. It is a, it is a text amendment that was initiated by uh, Birch and Cracciolo. Uh, before we get into the slides, um, I, I do wanna say that the way that this typically works is the applicant will provide a letter or, or the application for the text amendment to the staff. And then the staff will evaluate the request as part of the text amendment and then work with the applicant you know, it's kind of like a back and forth. We're, we're acceptable with this part of the language, but maybe not this part. So I wanted the commission to understand that even though it's a privately initiated amendment, that we as a staff reviewed this in a, you know, a fulsome manner to, you know, best assure that whatever we change is in the best interest of the city and the neighborhood. So the distinction is that it's a privately initiated amendment, but we did work with them and we had our, conducted our own sort of internal review on the language. Um, moving forward, uh, the purpose of the amendment is to amend section 21505 to revise regulations associated with gas service stations and their accessory equipment as it relates to residentially zoned property. Um, sort of a, a, a sort of a policy statement um, as we evaluate text amendments as we evaluate our zoning ordinance, as we evaluate our general plan. We have to be responsive to, you know, changing conditions, changing techniques. Um, for example, you know, technology evolves over time. Lighting gets better. You know, you have in the old days, you had, you know, really bright lighting. Now you have Cobra lighting with, you know, down lighting and, and LED and just different types of lighting. So I say all that to sort of speak to the fact that we're considering this policy change because in the future, the change that we're or they have requested and that we're recommending might allow for some greater flexibility to attract mixed use development. So what that really means is if there's a particular mixed use development that has a gas station as a part of the overall development, the current requirements of 200 feet to both single family and multifamily are seen as, as somewhat restrictive. And as we go through the slides, I also wanna mention that, remember that this amendment doesn't affect 
existing buffering, existing landscaping, existing setbacks that all of the other commercial zoning districts would, would, would maintain. This does not change any of that. Um, so as we, as we evolve through the slides, I'm gonna explain what, what we are changing and what we're deciding to keep, keep the same. Uh, just sort of a historical perspective, when the uh, limitations on uses section of the zoning ordinance were adopted, uh, it wasn't uncommon for separation requirements. But as I mentioned, you know, technology changes, conditions changes, the nature of the city changes. Um, one thing to also remember is one thing that kind of allows us to consider amendments to our zoning ordinance are that other portions of our sort of planning documents over time, it's, it's sort of like rising tides. The design review manual improves, the buffering standards in other sections, the setbacks and, and things of that nature improve. So you, you may be able to relax or amend other areas of the code because those aspects are covered in a, in a more efficient and better manner in other sections. Um, the original ordinance addresses noise, smoke, dust, vibration, and illumination. Uh, the current spacing limitations, so the way that the code exists now, uh, places limitations between gas stations, uh, the convenience store itself, fuel canopies and equipment to both single family and multi-family zone property. And as I've mentioned, planning processes evolve over time. The way that we view our zoning ordinance today might not be the same way that it was viewed 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the, a summary of the proposed changes are that the amendment clarifies language in section 21505A5 to remove restrictions on distance requirements to canopy, so the fuel canopy, dispensers, and storage tanks to multifamily residentially zoned lots. So in other words, we would re remove the, the requirement for 200 feet to those attributes when commercial property is adjacent to multifamily. The amendment retains two, the 200 feet of distance as currently in the ordinance between those attributes and single family residentially zoned lots. So the, the building, the fuel canopy, and the, any, any sort of like fuel storage uh, tanks would remain at 200 feet to single family residentially zoned lots. Uh, there's also a distance requirement in 21505A5 that uh, maintain sort of separation between other gas stations so that you don't have a sort of a flooding of an area with gas stations. That's also not changing. So we're, we're keeping that. As part of our analysis, uh, we feel comfortable with this amendment because all of the operational and physical characteristics of a gas station, regardless of it being adjacent to multifamily or single family residentially zoned property, would still be uh, covered by the conditional use permit, just like in our last application. The commission would still uh, hear applications related to gas stations as part of the CUP. Uh, the proposal retains the distance requirements to single family residentially zoned lots. Uh, we are adding a, a slight change to not include common area tracks. So if you had a, a single family uh, residentially zoned lot, but you had a very large sort of like landscape track, that, that would not count as far as the distance requirements. Um, I want to reiterate the proposal doesn't change the zoning ordinance's land use matrix. If you've looked at the zoning ordinance in the non-residential section, there's a, a table of uses where certain zoning districts allow different things as a permitted use, a conditional use. None of that is changing. Uh, as far as our key findings, we find that the language accommodates existing protections for single family properties. Uh, but will allow for a better integration of non-residential and multifamily uses. Uh, elimination of three portions of the code uh, eliminates redundant regulations that are found other, where, why, other place in the zoning ordinance and the design review manual. And it ma maintains the requirement that all, all gas service stations will still undergo conditional use permit review for adequate compatibility with adjacent uses. Um, 
that's pretty much all I have for this presentation. Uh, staff recommends approval of case TA-1903 to the city council and uh, Mr. Greathouse is here uh, on behalf of the applicant. Very good. Thank you for your report. Um, any, any questions of Mr. Cleghorn before we go further down into the agenda? Are we going to invite, so is it appropriate to have the app, uh, the, the text amendment or text change requester up to speak at this time or not in this case? If they wish, if they wish. So to, it's appropriate to design. invite them to come up and make a comment. Okay. Mr. Chair, you can certainly choose to ask the staff questions or you could invite the applicant up. Okay. I, I think we're going to do that. Any, let me start with any questions of staff before I invite the other gentleman. Okay. Can I ask this? Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I would I would assume a lot of these separations from uh, from between um, residential and and dispensing stations has something to do with safety. Um, is it has it like the fire department looked at these regulations and in agreement with uh, with staff on that? Um, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Hutchinson, through the chair, our our applications are reviewed by a, a wide range of departments. Uh, our applications are routed to the fire department, engineering, site development, traffic, and uh, fire did not have any objections to this. Um, the one, excuse me, the one thing I wanted to reiterate is um, this is a textual change just to the 200 feet of those three things that I mentioned, the canopy, the building, and the tanks to multifamily. But all of the other sort of zoning related criteria, you know, like buffering, setbacks, landscaping, uh, you know, like the height of the wall that might be, you know, on the boundaries of the property, none of that will be changing. But to answer your specific question, fire did not have any, um, they didn't have any concern with the application. And if I may, Mr. Hutchinson, um in commission, and let me kind of elaborate in terms of why we thought it would be appropriate. We have certain instances within the city already that if a gas station was built first, the multifamily or the apartment building uh, went in uh, separately from that. They did not require that same 200 feet for the multifamily. So it's not in particular for a fire or a safety consideration. Uh, when the ordinance was originally developed, it was to address the noise, the odor, and everything else. But technolo technology has changed. We, as Mr. Clayhorn indicated, FIRE does review uh, building plans as they come in. If there was a safety consideration or a spacing requirement, they address it at that particular level uh, through FIRE rating and other means. What, they, what we have found is no additional spacing requirements are needed. What we have within the landscape and buffering setbacks and the building setback in itself appropriately covers those issues on both sides of the fence because there is buffering and setbacks uh, in adjacent to what the gas station would be required. There's also a landscaping and buffering setback with what the multifamily piece would be required. So we thought it would be appropriate, uh, given that we have a number of instances in the city that this condition exists and we have no uh, concerns or ongoing issues in these cases, that we thought it would be appropriate to remove that kind of arbitrary 200 feet uh, spacing requirement. We did think it would be appropriate, however, to maintain it from a single family perspective. It's a little bit different characteristic. Uh, I'll, I'll pick on QT an example. So when we had 91st, or sorry, when we had Rio Vista and T-Bird, that was a QT for the longest time. We had the apartment uh, complex go in adjacent to it. What we found was a number of the residents actually utilized the convenience store as an added service rather than getting in their car and going to a grocery store. So it actually kind of uh, assists in walkability because it's adjacency with that convenience store. So we're still looking for the canopy and mitigating those issues through the CUP and we'll address it through uh, what we have uh, on site specific conditions. But like we said, we have a number of instances. We don't think that 200 feet is appropriate at this time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any further questions of staff? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open the public hearing. Uh, would the applicant like to speak to the requested text modification? 
Uh, good evening, members of the Commission. Brennan Ray, 702 East Osborne, here on behalf of the applicant QT. I'm happy to make a robust presentation if this group would like, uh, but in light of the thorough presentation that staff made in their report and tonight, and given the late hour, I will just merely stand up and say we agree with staff, uh, everything that they said, and we would request this body's recommendation for approval. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? I guess we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, I assume no speaker request forms on this item? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. All right, any further questions or comments from staff before I request a motion? All right, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that we recommend approval of case TA19-03 to City Council. Thank you, Commissioner Grace. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Alsop. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval of case TA19-03 to City Council. Commissioners, please cast your vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our final agenda item tonight. Woo, and it was a long one, wasn't it? We are almost done. Uh, election of officers, discussion and possible action to elect officers for the Planning and Zoning Commission for 2020. Uh, does staff want to set this one up? <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, members of the commission, every year about this time, we come back in front of you because it is time once more to elect officers for this coming year for the duration. So just kind of former and current, um, Mr. Nelson, you have been in place for one year. Mr. Oluski, the same, and Mr. Patterson, Mr. Patterson in one year as well. What does that mean? You are all eligible to serve in your current positions one more year, should you choose, or should your um, cohorts in crime elect you and you accept? If uh, you choose not to, and anybody else would like to join in the fun, it is open uh, for anybody, for chairman, for vice chairman, and for secretary. So, what I would like to do is open it up for nominations for chairman, if, if uh, someone is so moved. Yes. Yep, this would be my pleasure to recommend that Commissioner Jeff Nelson stay in his position for <laughs> the year. If I would make that motion. Second. If that's what that means. <laughs> Very kind of you, I accept the nomination. Any other nominations? Hearing none, may I have a vote, please? <laughs> Are we missing one? Me? Mr. J. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I understand your hesitancy. Serious internal debate. Been around so long. Have you? <laughs> All right, congratulations, Mr. Appreciate Chairman. We look forward All to right, another year. <laughs> uh, with that, um, nominations for Vice Chair. I nominate J. Aluski as Vice Chair. I take it. May I have a vote, please? Less internal discussion, it is 7-0 also. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, uh, for secretary, any nominations? I'd like to nominate um, Brian Patterson. Second. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a stellar job. All right, any other nominations? Let's vote. All right, thank you much. All right, thank you everyone. We have our board officers for 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, next item agenda, uh, next agenda item, excuse me, is called to the public. <laughs> I don't see public, uh, so I'll assume there is no uh, uh, comments from the public on non-agenda items. So we'll move on to updates from staff. Does staff have anything to report tonight? Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll spare you a, a long report tonight, but you'll see on the screen what our next meeting is, and, and thankfully, uh, given all the items tonight, we don't have an, an, uh, 
PNZ meeting on February 6. Our next regular meeting will be on February 20. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, any commissioners have anything to report tonight? All right. Seeing no further business, I call this meeting adjourned.